Well, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, we are assured the witness is coming, but we are going to go ahead and begin, and uh, he will be sworn in separately if, uh, if he arrives after that. The meeting, hearing will come to order. The Oversight and Government Reform Committee exists for two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know what they get for their money. Washington takes from, I'm sorry, bad day. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, America has a right to know what they get. You know, one of those days, I'm going to skip this. I brought the wrong glasses. I'm really embarrassed. I'm trying to read them and I can't. Okay. Without the glasses, we, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We, work, we will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. And good morning again. Our hearing today is going to scrutinize government agencies and the, and the Federal regulatory process. We not only know on this committee that it is flawed and that it often publishes, punishes job creators and stifles economic growth. But President Obama has spoken about and even launched an effort to evaluate regulations that create unnecessary burdens, that, uh, unnecessary burdens. Regulatory agencies under this administration, though, have gone in the opposite direction. And understand, regulatory agencies under every administration have a push to do more. But under this administration, we have increased from 2044 in 2009 to 2439 in 2010. Another way of putting it is they pass more laws than we do here in Congress. Their laws are not subject to, to accounting in, in the way that we are. If we cost more money, we have to find offsets. Regulatory agencies have an inherent right to pass on cost to you. We have seen the budgets of these regulatory agencies grow by 16 percent over the last three years. Investors Business Daily summarized, the Federal Government's regulatory operation were a business. It would be the 50th largest in this country in terms of revenue and the third largest in terms of employees. Regulators in America represent a larger workforce than all of McDonald's workers, Ford's workers, Disney's and Boeing's combined. With a quarter of a million regulators, it is, there is no question that job security is, by in fact, growing their operation. Employment at, regulator, regu, employment at regulatory agencies has climbed 13 percent since President Obama took office, and the number of staff working on regulatory matters is scheduled to increase at a rate of 10,000 new employees per year over the next two years. The number of full-time regula regulators now is expected to reach, in 2012, 291,000. Meanwhile, since President Obama took office, private sector jobs have declined by 5.6 percent. We don't blame the President for the growth of regulation. We don't blame the President for the loss of jobs. But under his watch, this has occurred. Under our watch, Mr. Cummings and myself, we have an obligation with the President to reverse this trend. The Administration has 219 economically significant regulations in the pipeline right now. If finalized, these would cost $100 million or more each year to the economy. That is a, minim <coughs> that is a minimum cost of $219 billion over 10 years. And understand, when I said that, it is each of them is significant. Therefore, each of them cost more than $100 million apiece. To date, the administration has already imposed 75 new regulations at a cost of more than $380 billion over 10 years. The business owners and workers who we will hear from 
today are not Fortune 500 executives. They are Main Street business owners and workers from around the country. They, their families, coworkers, and employees bear the cost of new and proposed regulations. For them, the business around the country is more, has a price greater than just compliance. It is, in fact, a hidden tax, uncertainty, and perhaps the loss of jobs not yet created or jobs that, are, that will not be retained. An uncertain regulatory climate breeds a market of uncertainty, for, forcing job creators' capital to wait on the sidelines. Making matters worse, the Federal agencies charged with serving as a watchdog over Federal rulemaking, ORIA, uh, has failed to take meaningful action to address the breakdown in this process. One of our questions today will be, if an agency says something is not economically significant, meaning less than $100 million, and later that is proven to be flawed, is there going to be a do-over, or do we simply assume that we didn't catch that one and it becomes law without the scrutiny of its economic impact? Today we will hear from Administrative Sustein and expect him to address specific details of why and how this has happened and what we can do to fix it. I would like to take note that the written testimony he will provide to the committee fails to answer the questions that we have asked. I intend to ask Mr. Sunstein, uh, Sunstein, thank you, to explain how the regulatory process can be circumvented, ignored, or openly flaunted by the bureaucracy in a manner contrary to direction given by the President. Thus far, the rhetoric we have seen from the Obama administration on the issue of regulatory reform has not matched its deeds. But we take the President at his word. We intend to assist in seeing that under our watch and under the President's watch, we reverse this trend. And in order to, uh, to be fair to the ranking member, I will put the rest of my opening statement in uh, at this time, and I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for uh, calling this hearing. I, I think every member of our committee would agree that creating jobs should be our committee's number one priority. The question is whether we can develop bipartisan solutions we can all support. When I go home to my district, only 40 miles away from here, my constituents tell me we need to find common ground, we need to focus on concrete proposals, and we need to pass them now. More than seven months ago, as one of my first actions as a ranking member, I wrote to the Chairman requesting that the committee hold hearings on an initiative proposed by President Obama in his State of the Union address. The proposal was to create jobs and strengthen the economy by investing in America's infrastructure. This proposal was endorsed by both the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO. As I said at the time, and I quote, these are exactly the kinds of bipartisan constructive initiatives our committee and Congress should support, end of quote. When the Chairman decided not to hold, hold that hearing, I placed my, record into, my statement into the record during a hearing just like this one, which focused on regulations. Since then, we have held 20 more hearings on regulations, but we have held few hearings on bipartisan proposals to create jobs. In his speech to Congress and to the Nation last week, President Obama renewed his call for bipartisan action on his infrastructure proposal to create jobs by rehabilitating homes, businesses, and communities, investing in a national infrastructure bank, modernizing 35,000 schools, and expanding access to high-speed wireless. As I said in a hearing yesterday, we have to be very careful in our country, because if we do not improve our in, uh, infrastructure, uh, we will be destroyed from the inside. On Friday, I sent another letter to the Chairman urging the committee to hold hearings on the President's infrastructure proposal, as well as other components of the American Jobs Act. I hope this committee will hold these hearings, and I hope we can be part of a helpful, positive solution. With respect to regulations, I support a balanced and thorough review designed to improve regulations. I think there is no member of this committee that would be against that. One of the things that we must ask as we approach this is will we get rid of regulation and, and what guarantees that jobs will be created? Will we be a in a situation where we have no regulations, 
businesses are making big money because they have gotten rid of the regulations. Benefits of the regulations are gone. Companies are making all kinds of money, and our poverty rate goes up, as was reported just yesterday, at an alarming rate. But if I, as I have said before, I strongly believe that any responsible effort to review regulations must consider both costs and benefits. Today, we will not hear a balanced view, by the way. Instead, we will hear a lopsided view about why some groups believe certain regulations are flawed. This approach narrows the information received by the committee and serves neither the regulatory process nor the public interest. If a regulation is problematic, we should hear that. But to ignore the benefits only fuels cynicism about how we do business in this nation. On a broader level, repealing health and safety regulations is no silver bullet. With all due respect to our witnesses from the Association of Reptile Keepers, repealing a so-called job-killing regulation to ally, allow more pythons, boa constrictors, and anacondas into the United States is not the kind of bold, bipartisan solution Americans are looking for to help the economy. I am also concerned that the committee may be expanding attacks on agencies charged with protecting American workers. This week, a witness was added to the hearing at the last minute. Apparently, he is a plaintiff in an ongoing lawsuit against the National Mediation Board who is objecting to rule changes under the Railway Labor Act. The District Court for the District of Columbia has already ruled against this plaintiff, but his case is scheduled to appeal, be appealed next week. In my opinion, it is time to work together and take action on proposals we should all be able to support. That is what the American people want. Mr. Chairman, with this in mind, I want to ask you if I can work together with you and with the other members of our committee to develop a joint, a joint bipartisan committee report with recommendations to the supercommittee on reducing the debt and increasing the jobs. As you know, the law was established that established the supercommittee, gave the committee, our committee, the option of submitting such a report by October the 14th. I think we should make a much more responsive contribution if we submit one together. We would make a much more responsive committee contribution if we did it together with recommendations on which we all can agree on. Uh, and I would ask, Mr. Chairman, if you would agree to do that. I think it is very important. I think we have a lot to contribute, particularly with the jurisdiction of our committee. I thank the gentleman in, in full answer to his question. I would certainly hope that we would submit joint uh, uh, suggestions and each of us, if necessary, submit separate uh, suggestions. I think that all of our comments, both the majority and minority and those which we can both agree on, should be submitted for the uh, committee's juris, uh, approval, and uh, I thank the gentleman for it. With that, I would like to recognize the, uh, the gentleman from Florida, the chairman of the Transportation Committee, Mr. Micah, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Cummings, for uh, convening this uh, important uh, oversight uh, hearing on uh, regulations and its effect. Uh, I was thinking, uh, how, do we, how do you get uh, all these regulations? And uh, we're, we're deluged with thousands of Federal regulations. And here's how we get them. Uh, uh, it was great to follow Mr. Cummings, because he's on the Transportation Committee, he talked about transportation. Now, this is, the, this is the list of current surface transportation programs and bureaucracy. This is what we deal with on our, uh, our committee and our jurisdiction. Um, look at them, uh, dozens and dozens. It started from less than a dozen programs. Now, every one of these programs, they have to produce rules and regulations. So just look at this chart and then look at what these people have to do. So one of the first things you have to do is collapse some of the bureaucracy. Some of these are duplicate uh, uh, activities and uh, actually passing out uh, all kinds of regulations that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, people have to deal with. Then the results are, um, are very important. And if you take something like Mr. Uh, Cummings talked about transportation projects, what the President talked about, we can throw all the money we want at uh, programs and uh, try to say we are going to put people to work in transportation. Uh, Here is the problem we face, and shovel ready has become a national joke. This is why it has become a national joke, because it just one of, uh, it, in, in, in this one chart here you see it takes you about six years to, to pass uh, 
uh, to, to comply with regulations to get any kind of transportation project that involves the Federal Government. Six years, so shovel ready has become uh, just, just uh, a joke because you can't do it. We have proposed actually to, less, uh, to, to uh, reduce the, the time if you, could, if, if you could do some approvals concurrently rather than consecutively. Uh, so we are not accused of running over any environmental standards or, or regulations. And many of these things are important to comply with. But this is what you have to com uh, comply with. Now, all these rules and regulations to do a simple project. So the rule of thumb is if the Federal Government gets involved, the project takes three times as long and costs three times as much. Uh, then uh, if you are trying to sh shovel money into these projects, which we have tried to do, and we have the latest proposal for, what, $450 billion, of which only 12 percent is transportation and infrastructure. You are going to run into the same problem they ran into last time. How many times do you hit your head against the wall and, and, and get a, a different result? <laughs> but uh, 35 percent of the $63 billion, $63 billion was the total out of $787 billion that went for, for infrastructure, $63 billion. 35 percent September 1st was still in Washington, D.C. They couldn't even spend it because of the regulations that uh, that inhibit the ability to move forward with a project. So we have got to change both uh, uh, the scope of the, the, the bureaucracies we have created, and we have got to reduce the regula regulations or at least find some way to move forward in a coherent fashion if you want compliance, and, and people do want compliance with certain things uh, in a reasonable fashion, and that is uh, what we are going to have to do. But, uh, Glad you uh, brought up the uh, subject, Mr. Cummings, and uh, thank you, Mr. Isa, for uh, holding this hearing. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I, I, you know, we usually don't have additional opening statements, but I, I thank the gentleman because you came well prepared and because hopefully this committee, which represents the job impediments that every committee of Congress deals with, will benefit from that. And I, well, I want to especially well, thank, thank you. you. And this is just a little microcosm, transportation. But, I mean, you all serve on different committees and deal with different issues in your communities. And you see how we've, we're strangling the nation in bureaucracy and regulations. And we've got, to, we've got to attack both. And this is a good start. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, you know, I think the President had a right in the State of the Union address when he talked about regulation and they are finding a middle ground. Um, you know, we can avoid unnecessary regulation. We can avoid duplicative regulation. It is a tough task, but it is important to do. But I do think that there are uh, mindsets and there is legislation that is designed to eliminate any new regulation and to uh, demonize it. So what I try to do is remind folks in this manner. Uh, try not to think about regulation at the Federal, State, or local level the next time you get on a commuter airliner. How much sleep has that pilot had? Try not to think about it if you are a miner in West Virginia, if you attend a State Fair, you are a fisherman in the Gulf of Mexico, or if you come to my town, Chicago. If you breathe in Chicago, where we are the asthma, morbidity, and mortality capital of the United States, the next time we have an ozone alert, <clears throat> if you want to put it off, wait till lunch when you have a turkey sandwich, or tomorrow morning when you have your eggs. About one in six Americans has food poisoning every year, a million cases of, of salmonella. Or if you just have a drink of water in Chicago where chromium levels are three times the healthy limit and lead levels are surprisingly high, depending on where you are, based on the distribution system. So I recognize that regulation isn't going to solve all our problems, but we have to constantly remind ourselves it shouldn't be just the day after a catastrophe that we say, well, we needed more government regulation. It is an even stream throughout our lives, recognizing that critical balance, not demonizing it, 
not cutting it off at the knees with lack of funding, but recognizing that middle balance that keeps us safe, keeps us healthy, healthy, because those catastrophes, those illnesses, those deaths cause us money, jobs, and it hurts the economy. I thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman I yield. I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Chairman, if uh, regulations and economic growth were inversely related, then sub-Saharan Africa would have the most productive economy on Earth. If regulations and economic growth were inversely related, then economic growth would have accelerated during the Bush administration and shrunken during the Clinton administration. In fact, mean household income today has declined to what it was in 1997. If an efficacious National Labor Relations Board actually impeded economic growth, then the 1950s and 1960s would not have produced the most sustained growth in middle class incomes in American history. In reality, there is no empirical basis for the claim that government regulation and economic growth are incompatible or even inversely related. In fact, the evidence seems to suggest the contrary. Consider the automotive industry. For decades, the big three successfully resisted legislative efforts to establish meaningful fuel efficiency standards. Their success resisting legislation contributed directly to American automobiles losing market share to more efficient vehicles produced in Asia. Today, following a Federal rescue, General Motors and Chrysler automotive manufacturers are deploying more efficient, more competitive products consistent with Federal regulation. Certainly, Mr. Micah has a point that we can find ourselves in a regulatory bind in which uh, regulation goes amok or becomes counterproductive. But the idea that somehow it is all or nothing is an unacceptable economic proposition. And as my colleague from Illinois just pointed out, from a human health point of view, regulation is essential because the marketplace is not self corrected uh, Mr. Cummings made reference to the fact that we are now reduced in this 22nd hearing on regulation, propounding this ideology that regulation is strangling the American economy, and if we only released it from regulation, jobs would flow and all would be well. We are now reduced to the point of actually hearing, no disrespect, Mr. Barkham, for about reptiles and how intrusive Federal regulation is in trying to protect the Everglades from now seeing pythons becoming an endemic species, killing off all kinds of flora and fauna that are native to the Everglades, and the fear that we have actually lost the battle because of lack of control, not because of too much control, of the importation of dangerous and foreign species into the United States. So I look forward to the hearing, Mr. Chairman, but I certainly reject the premise. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. All members will have seven days to submit additional opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We now recognize our first panel of witnesses. <clears throat> Dr. John Graham is Dean of the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. He served as the Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs within the Office of Management and Budget from 2001 to 2008. And at that time, it was easier to get through security here. You have our apologies for the trouble you had. Mrs. Uh, Roby Lavalley, or Lee, Lee Valley, uh, is the co-owner of Homestead Meats, a direct meat marketing business that has been in operation since 1995. Uh, hopefully, there are no PETA people objecting to what you do. Uh, Mr. David Arkush is the director of Congre Con Congress Watch at Public Citizen. Thank you, a returning guest. Mr. David Barker is owner of Pre Vita Preciosis. Actually, I understand it translates to Precious International, uh, a business specializing in research and captive breeding of pythons and boas. And I could do too much talking about those being two of the names in my old alarm company, but we will we'll stay off of that for today. And Mr. Matthew Palmer, who is a flight attendant at Delta Airlines, testifying his own behalf. And I will support the gentleman, uh, the ranking member's uh, statement. 
we do not have witnesses here to talk specifically about their litigation or to support their litigation. Uh, we agreed to have you here. We think it is appropriate because of your experience relative to the effect of Delta. But please understand that we will limit on both sides of the aisle our questions to not specifically uh, pertain to any litigation. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses are to be sworn. Would you all rise to take the oath? Raise your right arms, hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, it, Dr. Graham, you know the routine here pretty well, but for the rest of you, uh, your entire opening statements, all of your printed material, and any additional material you choose to present to the committee will be included in the record. So the pretty close to exactly five minutes you will be given to make an opening statement. You can read, read from your prepared notes. We strongly suggest that you use this time, though, to expand on what you have already presented to us so that both may be part of the record. Uh, you will see the light in front of you, basically pretty straightforward. If it is green, you are fine. If it is yellow, wrap up. If it is red, please stop at the end of the, the full sentence and no run-on sentences. With that, Dr. Graham. Oh, and then there is that thing about little, if you hit the button, button twice, it will be off again. So, okay. uh, And then when you are finished, turn it off so the next person doesn't have an echo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The hearing this morning occurs at a time of our country in economic distress. The unemployment rate was 5 percent in early 2008. It rose to over 10 percent in October of 2009. Last year, it appeared the recovery was on the way, but now we appear to be stuck around 9 percent unemployment. And as Mr. Cummins mentioned, we learned today about 15 percent of Americans are now officially recorded to be in poverty. Any sustained recovery has to have two basic things, fewer layoffs of people and more business investment and hiring. What is the connection to the regulatory system? It has been well accepted for decades that the regulatory climate affects how businesses and consumers think about their future decisions and their investments. Right now, virtually all major sectors of our economy are facing potentially big new regulatory burdens. I refer to manufacturing, mining, energy, agriculture, and even higher education are all about to be subject to substantial new regulatory programs. Is the Obama administration and OIRA in a good position to handle these issues? I think we are in a good news, bad news situation. The good news is President Obama has personally and publicly expressed concern about the need for regulatory reform, and he has put OIRA to work to try to streamline some existing regulations. He has also recently returned publicly a regulation to the Environmental Protection Agency that deals with ozone on the grounds that it is not a good timing from the standpoint of the economy. The Obama administration also has an administrator of OIRA, Cass Sunstein, a talented and deeply knowledgeable person about regulatory issues and about cost-benefit analysis. The bad news we face at the time is that there is clear evidence that the number of costly regulations coming out of the Federal Government is on the rise. And perhaps more troubling, the number of costly regulatory proposals that are in the agendas of the agencies are also on the rise. And this is the prospect that is of concern to people who care about the relationship of regulation and the economy. Now, in fairness to the administration, their argument will be, and you have heard some of this this morning already, that the benefits of these regulations are also growing. And in fact, in some cases, these benefits are larger than the costs. So maybe in some sense we are doing better even though we are feeling worse. My concern, however, is, is that the numbers we are talking about in terms of benefits and costs, it is the agencies, the regulators who generate these numbers. And if OMB and OIRA do not police these numbers, they can tell a very rosy story even though the facts are, in fact, not in their favor. A related concern I have is if you look at the actual record of the administration in returning regulations to agencies due to poor cost-benefit analysis, 
There is not a single case of a public return letter to a regulatory agency now almost three years into this administration due to poor cost-benefit analysis. I included in my written statement an example where President Bush and President Obama basically agreed on a regulatory issue, the higher mileage standards for cars and trucks. And what I did is I showed you how the benefit and cost estimates for these regulations have changed simply in the two administrations. And all of a sudden, the benefits of these mileage standards are much more substantial than they used to be. I am not sure that these changes in the way the benefit estimates are made have a good scientific or economic foundation, but we are told now by the regulators that these mileage standards are much more beneficial than they used to be. There are also very interesting, peculiar things going on in these regulations. You look, for example, at manufacturers who are considering whether to put a hybrid engine in or a diesel engine in or a natural gas engine in their cars, we now have a proposal from the Obama administration that if they do an electric car, they get to count that car as two vehicles instead of one for compliance purposes. And they are also allowed to count that vehicle as if it emits zero pollution for five model years, even though we all know that pollution to some extent is generated back at the power plant where the electricity comes from, and clearly that should be included in this type of analysis. So my concern is the kinds of issues that OIRA and OIRA staff are typically very diligent about, the cost-benefit analysis underlying these rules, it is not as vigilant as I think it needs to be, and this committee needs to take a very strong interest in how these analyses are done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you for being the consummate professional on the five-minute rule. Mrs. Lee Valley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings. I have been a beef producer all of my life, and my two boys represent the fourth generation on our ranch. In addition to our ranch, my family and I are co-owners of Homestead Meats, a direct beef marketing business that owns and operates a packing plant regulated by USDA. So not only do I produce high-quality cattle, I also took the initiative to process and package beef in order to provide a great eating experience for my customers. Our business is built on relationships and marketing alliances that allow me to produce a high-quality beef that my customers demand, quality for which we get paid a premium for. The proposed GYPSA rule, however, will cripple our ability to market cattle the way we want impacts our small business model and limits consumer choices. I strongly believe in the fundamental American business tenet of a willing buyer and seller being able to enter into a private business contract because it protects my cattle marketing contracts and it is the heart of our small business. GYPSA believes my contract should be approved by the government and posted on the Internet. It goes on to say that because I am part owner in a packing plant, I should not be able to sell my cattle to other packers. This provision violates privacy and limits business opportunities. For years, USDA has promoted exactly what we are doing, sell direct to the consumer, operate as a packing plant in a strategic area of the country and produce local food. We responded to consumer demand, we followed USDA's lead, and now we are being punished. This is a slap in the face to innovative businessmen and women across the U.S. The proposed GYPSA rule offers neither clarity nor clear definition in terminology. Elimination of the competitive injury requirement will provide a disincentive for value-added marketing because of fear of litigation. The vague definitions such as unfair or reasonable person will open the door to an increased number of lawsuits because mere accusations without economic proof are enough for USDA or an individual to bring lawsuits against a buyer. This will be a trial lawyer's dream and will cause cattle prices to spiral downward. Does increased government intervention and litigation determine fairness? And who pays for this? Cattle producers will pay. What happens to every other industry when litigation increases? Creativity, partnerships, Balance and the desire to take a chance end, which is the very basis of the entrepreneurial spirit of the American business owner. Do you truly want that for the beef industry or the livestock industry? This rule requires buyers of cattle to justify the price paid for my livestock. And what will be the justification and who sets that? This regulation seems to infer that it is the role of big government, and I strongly oppose the government setting or justifying the prices paid for my cattle. 
I have serious concerns about the process behind this rule. As you know, the rule is a result of language included in the 2008 Farm Bill. However, we believe the rule published goes beyond the intent of Congress because it includes provisions that are similar to ones that were defeated by votes on the Senate floor or through subcommittee or through committee action. This rule did not include a cost-benefit analysis. NCBA was one of several groups that looked, commissioned an independent analysis by Informa Economics to look at the impact. The report concluded this rule would result in the loss of over 23,000 jobs, annual GDP loss of $1.6 billion, and annual tax revenue losses of $360 million. This is well over the $100 million threshold to be considered economically significant. But the rule was not treated that way. We appreciate the letter sent by 147 members of the House of Representatives asking for a full cost-benefit analysis, but it, Secretary Vilsack has said the analysis won't be open for review or comment. The report also estimates annual cost of $62 million just to cattle producers alone. Overall, we believe the process in formulating the rule is flawed and broken. Value-based marketing has given our family and given families across the United States the business opportunity to compete for market share at the highest level. It accounts for 62 percent of the actual cattle contracts across the United States is value-based marketing. We do not need big government setting up shop on our farms and ranches and government intrusion into the private marketplace is not the answer. I urge the committee to help stop this rule from being finalized and is detrimental to ranchers, consumers, and the entire U.S. economy. Thank you. And thank you. Mr. Arkish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, all of us here agree that the regulatory process is in some sense broken. I disagree, I think, with a lot of people here on how exactly it is broken. Uh, what I see in the record before this committee is uh, strong evidence of enormous net benefits to health, safety, and the economy. And given those benefits, uh, it is surprising that we make it so hard for our public protection agencies to do their jobs. So on the benefits of regulations, there are obvious enormous human benefits from public protections. We are talking about millions of lives, uh, people's health, children's IQ points, clean air, clean water. I have a lot of specifics in my written testimony. I am not going to go into that in, in, in any greater depth. It is controversial to try to put these benefits in narrow economic, uh, economic terms because it is hard to put a price tag on them. Uh, it is easy to understate benefits when we look at them monetarily, and it is easy to overstate costs. Um, but even when you look at regulation and evaluate it through this narrow lens of economic cost-benefit analysis, the benefits are overwhelming and they overwhelm the costs consistently. The authoritative resource on this is the annual report from OMB to the Congress uh, evaluating the past 10 years' major uh, regulations. Across both the Bush administration and the Obama administration, these reports have come out every single year showing uh, massive, overwhelming benefits of regulations compared to their costs. The most recent report showed that on average over the last 10 years, health, safety and environmental regulations have had benefits seven times as great as their costs. That is a 700 percent return on investment. It is hard to find that kind of return on investment anywhere in the United States, but you can find it from our regulatory agencies. An often overlooked uh, benefit of regulations is that they can drive innovation. As Mr. Connolly was uh, saying in his opening remarks, the auto industry, by fighting fuel economy standards for two decades, put itself at a severe disadvantage. Uh, when consumer preferences shifted uh, and, and consumers desired much more fuel-efficient vehicles, and the U.S. auto industry uh, had a disadvantage compared to foreign manufacturers who had been focusing on fuel economy. Fuel economy standards would have, uh, would have forced auto manufacturers uh, to make the decisions that it turns out consumers actually wanted and bring their, uh, bring their fuel standards into the 21st century. Another uh, often missed benefit of regulation is that it can actually help grow jobs. In the current economy, our principal problem is a lack of demand. Uh, companies have, a lot of companies have idle cash sitting around that they are not investing in their businesses because they are afraid that if uh, they invest in new products or services, there won't be any demand for those products or services. It is a good time to enact public protections that will bring those industries into the 21st century in terms of environmental protections or worker protections, uh, and in the process, uh, 
uh, use that idle cash to, to buy upgrades in equipment or hire service people or, or, or build other improvements to processes uh, that will boost the economy and create jobs. We also shouldn't overlook the harms of deregulation. The big example in this area recently is the financial crisis. The financial sector was deregulated over the past several decades, and in short order it collapsed on itself. It imploded under the weight of its own reckless and predatory practices uh, in the absence of, of good government oversight. The costs are hard to overestimate uh, in this area. Uh, we are 11 million jobs behind where we should be in the United States economy, if not for the Great Recession. Uh, it, the uh, financial crisis evaporated trillions of dollars worth of wealth uh, and cost billions and trillions of dollars of government bailouts and other supports. So here is how the system is broken. Given all the benefits of regulation and given the severe harms of underregulation, we make it far too hard for our public protection agencies to do their jobs. The agencies that protect our health, safety and environment are some of the most heavily regulated entities in the United States. They have to comply with the Administrative Procedure Act, the Paperwork Reduction Act, which creates paperwork, the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, the Congressional Review Act, several executive orders, and they are subject, subject to judicial review. In all, there are uh, as many as 110 requirements an agency needs to comply with just to write a rule. As a result, even when an ag agency wants to write a simple, non-controversial rule, it can take up to 10 years. Uh, my organization published a report earlier this year uh, talking about one of those examples. The construction industry got together with labor unions and public interest groups. Everybody thought we needed a new rule to protect crane safety. It still took 10 years to produce because of the burdens on OSHA. Here is the important point. When rules have massive, massive economic benefits, there are equally massive costs when we delay the creation of those rules. On average, the OMB estimates that the benefits of rules outweigh the costs by $9 to $59 billion a year. That means that when we delay major rulemakings by one year, we are costing the U.S. economy $9 to $59 billion. We need to give public protection agencies the resources they need to do their jobs, and we need to reduce unnecessary burdens on them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barker. Uh, if you turn your mic on. Mr. Thank Chairman you. and members of the committee, my name is David Barker. I am a published herpetologist and an entrepreneur engaged in the breeding and sales of pythons and boas. I am grateful for this opportunity to relate some of the problems, legal shortcomings and job killing aspects of the Interior Department's and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's proposal to add nine species of large snakes to the injurious wildlife list under the Lacey Act. A listing under the Lacey Act makes it a Federal crime to import or export these species or move them across State lines. And this would be the first time a species in common pet ownership was so listed. The Fish and Wildlife Service has not considered the economic impact of this listing, failing, as the Small, Bus as the Small Business Administration Office of Advocacy noted, to fulfill its duties under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. The proposed action also constitutes an inappropriate taking of property, impacting as many as a million Americans. Finally, it is based on an insubstantial scientific analysis that has not withstood scrutiny or subsequent review. Taking that last issue first, the basis for the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed action can be traced back to a paper published in early 2008 concluding that pythons would find the climate of the southern third of the continental United States to be favorable and predicting that these pythons were likely to invade the United States all the way from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. The two past cold winters have now laid to rest that fear. Pythons and boas will not survive anywhere in the continental United States except extreme southern Florida. In the past two years, there are four published papers that describe how pythons fail to survive in cold weather, and three of those papers are co-authored by government biologists and academics contracted by the Interior Department agencies. Secondly, the proposal to invoke the Lacey Act is not a valid use of this federal criminal statute. The simple truth is that the proposed action, one, will not solve or correct any problem regarding these snake species in South Florida, and two, it will destroy American businesses and it will damage hundreds of thousands of people economically, and three, it threatens as many as Americans as many as a million law-abiding American citizens and their families with the penalty of a felony conviction for pursuing their livelihoods, for pursuing their hobby, 
or for simply moving with their pet to a new state. States should be allowed the freedom to regulate this industry as they see fit without heavy-handed federal intervention. In my own personal circumstance, if the proposed action is implemented, it will directly and negatively affect my wife's and my incorporated small business and our family income. It will destroy more than 20 years of work, and it essentially confiscates the value of our investments in breeding stock and equipment, and it removes all value to our colony of breeding animals. It will stop all of our interstate and international business, which is 90% of our business. It will immediately reduce our family income by 35% or more at a time when income and work come hard. It will likely ruin our retirement. And additionally, our business is interconnected with many other local businesses, large and small, that will be negatively affected. There are thousands of other families with small snake breeding businesses similar to ours. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service utterly failed to take any hard look at these economic impacts, and they failed to, con to consider reasonable alternatives to federal regulation that were offered by my industry. As the Office of Advocacy noted, the agency failed to meet its most basic duties under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. Finally, a little discussed issue regards the disaster that may follow the implementation of this proposed rule. What's going to happen to the million or so animals that suddenly are without value? Many, of course, may be maintained into the future by their current owners, but what will be the outcome for the animals that are suddenly unwanted or unaffordable? The proposed action makes no provision for the disposal of these animals. Zoos will not take even one of them. Animal shelters are completely unprepared and generally without trained staff, equipment, cages, or food. The, impl the implementation of the proposed action may precipitate the greatest slaughter of pet animals in American history. I thank the opportunity for this for this I thank the committee for this opportunity to voice my concerns and if there are any questions I will do my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Good morning, Mr. We Chairman. Agree. Thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is Matthew Palmer and I'm a proud Delta flight attendant. I began my career with Delta in 2008 and have been based both in New York City and Atlanta. I have had the privilege of visiting five continents and seeing more than 20 countries. I have carried celebrities, common folk, and even shared jet service to D.C. with President Jimmy Carter en route to President Obama's inauguration. A number of my colleagues, other Delta flight attendants, both pre-merger Northwest and Delta alike, are here with me who have, like me, been harmed by government re regulation. Combined, all of us have hundreds of years of experience as Delta flight attendants. My colleagues at Delta Airlines have three times in the past decade been involved in representational elections. Each time, the Association of Flight Attendants were seeking to bargain on our behalf. AFA has failed each time to secure the votes of confidence needed to step into that role. The first two of these elections were conducted according to the 75-year-old former rules of the National Mediation Board and the Railway Labor Act rules supported by both Republican and Democratic administrations. That leads to my main concern. A new rule arranged by union insiders and pushed through by the NMB has changed the election landscape despite strong objections from both airlines and, more importantly, from thousands of employees who do not want forced union representation. The NMB changed the election procedures to enable unions to be certified with a minority of a work group there was no change to the archaic decertification process, which is convoluted at best and requires a, quote, straw man posing as a union to win an election. In fact, decertification has never been successfully used in a large employee group in the airline and railroad industries. When Delta and Northwest were merging into the world's largest airline, all signs indicated that the world's largest flight attendant union the AFA was in backdoor dealings with board members Linda Pachala and Harry Hoaglander, both of whom previously served as AFL-CIO union officials with the AFA and Airline Pilots Association, respectively. The Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO during this time secretly petitioned the NMB for a change in the voting rule to organize a union. This was not disclosed to the pre-merger Delta flight attendants who was intended to affect, and more shocking, not to the pre-merger Northwest flight attendants who were actually represented them by the AFA, despite the fact 
that AFA President Patricia Friend served as Secretary of the Transportation Trades Department herself. Call me foolish, but I believe she should effectively communicate this to her members. Patricia Friend did not. So even with the rules tilted in the favor of the unions, in the most recent election, 94 percent of Delta flight attendants turned out to vote, and the majority voted to reject AFA representation once again. Following, the AFA then had the gall to say that the high turnout rate indicated Delta interfered in the election. Their argument, apparently, was that too many people voted. Now, the same two members who discarded 75 years of precedent are considering requests from the unions to now disregard how we voted and now force us to redo elections under rules that are even more favorable to unions. Mr. Chairman, I want the NMB to respect our vote. I want them to respect the votes of the majority of Delta flight attendants and Delta employees and other work groups who prefer to have a direct relationship with our company. I believe the majority of my coworkers agree with me that workers should make decisions about their representation, and a government agency such as the NMB should not impose its judgment on employees. Rather, they should be a neutral referee of elections. We have been held hostage by the NMB and the union for three years since our merger. Our pre-merger employee groups, some of which are here today, are forced to be kept separate so we are not able to get the full benefits of our merger. I cannot speak for Delta Airlines and I will not pretend to. In fact, despite my testimony echoing that of many of my colleagues at Delta, what I have said is only my reality. Frankly, I don't care whether one is pro-union or not. What I am concerned about is the fact of my pay, my work rules, my stock, my livelihood, my friends, my colleagues and our system of government are all being affected by the partisanship of this board working to do the bidding of unions for whose elections they are supposed to be neutral. They are biased and they should not be. All should agree it is time that they be reined in. I would like to thank the committee for their time. Thank you. Thank you all for your statements and a near record that everybody was right there at or below the five minutes, which helps all of us. And I would caution all of my colleagues, we will do the same on our questions. With that, I will recognize myself for five or With that, I uh, will now entertain a document, unanimous consent, if you are ready. I will just submit it when I Oh, you will. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I will submit during my opening statement. Uh, I am asking unanimous consent that the Committee on Oversight's uh, staff report prepared for this hearing be accepted without objection. Do you have the other one? Yeah. Additionally, I am submitting uh, for unanimous consent letters in support of the GIPSA position. Saval's position. So, without objection, so ordered. And I will now get past that procedure. Uh, Dr. Graham, I uh, I am concerned about something that is not directly related to this, but, but I am concerned, as Mr. Palmer and others have been, about circumventing, uh, Mrs. Lee, Lee Valley, uh, circumventing the process. Isn't one of the areas that is growing in circumventing sue and settle, not just the EPA, but throughout government, in which if you settle a case, you effectively bypass all of the protections that are being complained about not being complied with here today? Uh, that is a good question. My experience when I was at OMB at OIRA is that the agencies and the Justice Department are responsible for developing these settlement agreements that commit agencies to doing certain regulations and in some cases to doing very specific content of regulation. Those consent decree arrangements do pose a problem for OMB because, in a sense, OMB is not it doesn't have a seat at the table when those consent decrees are signed. And they are they're agreed to without scoring, effectively. Well, and there is no, there's no cost-benefit analysis to what they are agreeing to. Uh, there is no legal analysis as to what they are agreeing to that is independent of the parties who are at that table itself. So uh, it is. A, it, is it, it's a, it, it puts OMB in a difficult position then to be having to review uh, independently and objectively a regulation that is emerging from a consent decree process where OMB was not a participant. Isn't that also true that when agencies do guidance rather than rulemaking, the same occurs, that implementing that guidance, there is no cost benefit? It is just a basically, uh, if you don't comply, then the regulatory system can, can hurt you. Well, at the same time, guidance, although theoretically not compelling, uh, can cost uh, those 
regulated entities a lot of money? Yes. In the, um, in the uh, bargaining and game between regulators and OMB, and of course that's a, that's a daily occurrence in this town, the regulators know that if they do a rule, they have to get OMB approval. But if they just issue a policy statement or a guidance or an, an enforcement suggestion, uh, these types of documents aren't covered by the executive order and are not typically reviewed by OMB and are certainly not subject to cost benefit. Lastly, analysis. during your or not lastly, but one other question: during your time at, at, through OMB, isn't it true that if guidance is implemented? then one of the justifications for rulemaking is it is already being done and therefore there is no incremental cost. Isn't that sort of the other part of the back door that often compliance to a guidance mitigates the cost and then it makes it easier to go to OMB for rulemaking after the fact? Certainly the agency can say, you know, we have got our foot in the door, we have already you know, got this experience with this. We are just, we're just trying to make it mandatory now, I mean, since we are already doing it through guidance, supposedly. But in a lot of cases, the guidance is itself de facto mandatory because there is an enforcement arm behind it. Lord knows that if the FDA suggests something and you have got drugs pending, it is pretty hard not to take their suggestion. Dr. Graham, I am going to uh, note uh, Mrs. Uh, Lee Valley's uh, statement and predicament. During your time in government, if you found that there was a circumvention of a cost benefit, in other words, something cost a lot more than $100 million, perhaps more than a, much more than a billion, it is discovered after the fact and then in a, a cabinet says, well, too bad, we are not going back to look at it. Although you were powerless to absolutely stop that, what would have been the position of any previous administration when you discover that a less than $100 million has become more than a billion, and, and it, it wasn't taken into consideration. Mr. Dr. Graham, I, Mrs. Lee Valley she has told us pretty, pretty well that what is happening to her, but would this have happened in any previous administration that you know of? No, but it's, it's, it is a, a, a situation that is of concern, without doubt. Okay. Mr. Barker, uh, I am I'm not necessarily a fan of your particular advocation, uh, but I, I do have a, an interesting question for you. Has there been any finding behind this that any, any of the uh, reptile that you have produced have ever caused any damage for which this proposed rule would be a cure? Or if you turn the mic on. The, no. Okay. It, it wouldn't. The animals are widespread. They are found in 49 states in the United States. They are held by more than a million American citizens. The Lacey Act won't. The problem is a state problem that exists only in southern Florida, and, and this, is a, this is an inappropriate uh, law that will have yeah. no effect whatsoever. If I had more time, I would have more questions. With that, I recognize the ranking. I want to pick up exactly where the uh, chairman left off. Mr. Barker, your group, the U.S. Association of Reptile Keepers, opposes a proposed rule for the Fish and Wildlife Service that bans the import and export of some dangerous snakes. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you raised your concerns during the formal notice and comment period, again, at an ORA uh, meeting, did you not? Did you do that? Have you raised these objections before? Yes, uh, in, the, in the public comment period, yes. That is, that is right. And did you, are you aware that, um, and I asked you unanimous consent to this letter of September 13th directed to the chairman uh, from 14 organizations, uh, including the Audubon Society of Florida, be admitted to the record? Without objection. Um, did, Without objection. Thank you very much. Did you realize that uh, there are organizations from Florida in the Everglades that are begging for these regulations? And let me just quote that, this letter. And by the way, it is from the Audubon Society of Florida, Florida Wildlife Federation, Everglades Foundation. I could go on and on. But it says, Florida's experience demonstrates that states would benefit from Federal leadership on this issue to ensure injurious species are restricted in a timely way before they become firmly established. Similar injurious status will be an important companion protection to Florida's state rules appropriately govern the Federal realms of import and interstate commerce. Were you familiar with that? Yes, sir. And so it is, and, and the reason, the only reason I am raising this, first of all, I, I sympathize with you. I, I understand I have ran a business. I understand you are concerned about the welfare of your wife and your family. Um, but I want to make sure that we understand there is another side to this. There are other people that are from your area 
who have a, a, an opposing view and they are very adamant. Um, Ms. Lee Valley, um, according to your testimony, you have concerns about the USDA's proposed rule to increase competition in the meatpacking market, and you testified before the USDA in a public panel, did you not? I did. An essential component of a fair and working regulatory process is that those who are impacted by a proposed rule have an opportunity to explain their concerns to the rulemaking body. That is the notice and comment period. You both had an opportunity to voice your concerns, and, and neither of the two rules you addressed is final. They are both still in the midst of the rulemaking process. And I want to direct your attention to a letter which I asked to be admitted into record dated September 13, 2011, addressed to the Chairman. Uh, and it is from uh, about 15 um, organizations, including the Campaign for Contract Agricultural Reform. I asked that it be admitted into record. Without objection. Let me just read from this, this letter so that we, again, these are people who are not here. They, they, I want to make sure that their voices are heard, and they refer to 191 others who have the same opinion. It says, in conclusion, we urge Congress to allow USDA to move forward expeditiously to implement a final rule that will strengthen and clarify the Packers and Stockyard Acts which, uh, uh, with common sense protections for farmers and ranchers, we urge you to stand with our nation's farmers, ranchers, growers, and consumers to oppose the efforts of meat uh, packer and poultry special interests to insulate themselves from federal scrutiny of their anti-competitive behavior and unfair treatment of farmers and ranchers. As a measure of support for the issuance of, of, of a gypsum rule, listen to this, we have attached to our letter an August 3, 2011 letter from 190 groups submitted to the Senate in support of finalizing the GIPSA uh, proposed rule. These uh, groups include, uh, represent thousands of farmers, ranchers, and consumers from around the nation. Again, I just want to make sure that there is there's another voice here. There are some other folks that uh, have a different view than what you have. Mr. A Mr. Arkers, the, the title of today's hearing is How a Broken Process Leads to flawed regulations. One of the things that I am concerned about, and you heard me say this in my opening statement, I have not heard too much here this morning so far that even if you get rid of the rules, that that creates jobs. Um, so do you hollow out a system, take away the regulations, take away the protections, uh, businesses make more money, poverty goes up, income goes down for employees, regulations out of the window, and what is the guarantee that we get jobs? And if, if we don't know uh, what either of these two final rules, by the way, this is my question real quick, if we don't know what either of these two final rules will look like, can we responsibly conclude that the process is broken or the regulations are flawed? Mr. Alkers. Uh, you are correct. There is no evidence, uh, empirical evidence, that uh, deregulation or a lack of regulation creates jobs. Uh, and to the contrary, there is some evidence that regulations can create jobs, and there is overwhelming evidence, particularly from the financial crisis, that is the big example that jumps out, that a lack of regulation can be devastating to the economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. It is uh, vitally important. I appreciate all of you who have uh, traveled here to be here and, and to testify. Uh, Mr. Palmer, I would like to direct my, my uh, questions to you. Um, and I just want to make sure I have this right. In, you had Northwest and Delta, great airlines uh, merging together, a, a move that was widely applauded as necessary in strengthening the airline industry and bringing together two great organizations. Um, that happened in October of 2008. In September of 2009, the AFL-CIO, in this letter that I have here that I would ask unanimous consent to insert into the record, I'm sure that'll be okay with the chairman if we uh, insert this into the record. Um, I'm so, I'm sorry, without objection. Thank you. Uh, the FL CIO sent a, a letter uh, to the National Mediation Board suggesting a rule change uh, that after 75 years, 75 years of precedent, that they wanted to have these rules changed. And my understanding is that now, three years, three years into this merger, there still has not been a resolution. There is not. So here you have. Um, a very large industry, uh, roughly $731 billion into our economy, transporting 50,000 tons a day in cargo, nearly 2 million people uh, per day. Um, there is this assertion that, well, maybe this doesn't have an effect, 
as the, as the chairman was saying, as the ranking member was saying, well, you know, it doesn't have any effect. It does have an effect. My understanding is here, according to a CNN article, it said, quote, on average, non-unionized Delta flight attendants take home 12 percent more than their non-unionized Northwest counterparts based on a typical 75-hour-a-month schedule. They enjoy more generous profit sharing and retirement matches from the company, and they don't have to dole out $43 a month to union dues. Now, Mr. Palmer, you don't strike me as an overtly uh, politi politically engaged person who is just here with, you know, partisan lenses on to, to extol the Republican. I mean, my, my sense of it is that um, you are just looking at this objectively and that you want to say to your, your colleagues and to this body, to the Congress as a whole, we want a resolution to this. Am I overstating that or is that? You are not. I would respectfully disagree with Mr. Cumming that it does not affect us. I will, I will bring it down from the uh, numbers that you you talked about. Mm -hmm. There is approximately 21,000 Delta flight attendants, and it affects every one of us every day. When you get on a Delta flight, you are going to get great service, but you are going to get great service from a Northwest crew or a Delta crew. Although our company has merged, we are not. So the CNN poll I am not familiar with, but I do know that on every level, Delta flight attendants are paid more per hour, according to seniority. Our per diem and other rates are higher. So. We are doing the same job. We are going to the same destinations, but because we are in laboratory conditions and because the NMB and the AFA are still messing around with our careers, Delta is not able to merge us fully. So there are at least 7,000, perhaps 8,000 of the pre-merger Northwest. This affects every day. And what does that do to the morale and, and uh, the atmosphere and the working conditions? When you are right next door, to, right next to somebody who is exactly the same, and let's pretend they are exactly the same in every way, what does that do to the working conditions there? The, the morale is certainly an issue because, uh, first of all, I said in my testimony earlier, I began at Delta in 2008. I was in training when that vote happened, so according to the rules, I wasn't able to vote on it. So practically my whole career I have been in laboratory conditions. Um, there are people who have served through other mergers. Some of the other mergers were probably a little more smooth than this one, but this one is Delta's telling us they are ready to move forward. The AFA is saying, no, we are not going anywhere. The, probably the best way I can describe it is non-Delta flight attendants have no voice in this. We can't say we are ready to vote. We can't petition the NMB to vote because we are not a union, don't want a union. Those at Northwest who were unionized, even though they lost their union last year because they cast their votes not to have it, they don't even have a voice anymore, nor do they have a union. So it is politics and bureaucracy and red tape. and. There is absolutely no stability right now with us. But well, my understanding is that you said, I believe, 94 percent of the people did participate in the last It was election. Not only was it 94 percent, but it was 94 percent under the new rules, which were actually more favorable to the union. And what was the result of that, of that vote, with 94 percent voting? Uh, I believe 9,500 out of us voted, 9,544 or so, but the AFA immediately filed interference charges with Delta, or not with Delta, with the NMB, perceiving that too many people voted so that their polls were off. They thought they were going to win, but because too many people voted, they were wrong and thus there was interference. Did you experience any interference? Absolutely not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Palmer, you are aware that when we have elections uh, for governor or for president or for members of Congress, that the people that stay home and don't vote do not have their votes counted as a no. I am right? aware of that, yes. Okay. And that rule that was changed, in effect, just said that basically when you have a vote in a union situation in your industry, they are not going to count the people that stay home as a no vote anymore, right? Correct. Okay. Does that seem unreasonable to you? It doesn't seem unreasonable okay. to me. Now, I have seen Matt. a motion in a lawsuit against the National Mediation Board that lists Matthew R. Palmer as one of the named parties uh, listed as interveners in the suit. Is that, uh, Mr. Palmer, the same person as you are? I am. Okay. And you intervened against the lawsuit against the National Mediation Board? I did. Okay. Uh, would, the, now, would, I the, would the gentleman yield for just a question? Yes. Uh, in my opening statement, pursuant to the ranking member's statement, we suggested strongly that we would not ask or a and have him answer related to the lawsuit because we 
because it, 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 it's something that we would like to avoid this committee getting in the middle of. And I would ask the gentleman to try to agree yeah. with the ranking member. If you really wanted to stay out of the middle of it, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Palmer wouldn't be sitting there, right? So let me, I'll make sure that we ask the questions and they don't skirt the lawsuit stuff, but let's be serious about this and not try to put him on there and then claim he can't ask him questions. All right, he's here for a purpose and let's discuss it. Now, as I understand it, the plaintiff's lawsuit alleged that two members of the National Mediation Board approached the rulemaking with an unalterably closed mind. You echoed that claim in your testimony here today, uh, and while you write that all signs indicate that the world's largest flight attendant union, the AFA, was in backdoor dealings with board members Linda Pachula and Harry Hoaglander. But the district court judge ruled against you and the other plaintiffs. He stated that the National Mediation Board had provided a neutral and rational basis for adopting the rule, and the judge determined that your allegations were insufficient to support even discovery in the issue. You didn't get in the door with it. The judge thought it was so weak. So the litigation is going on right now, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. The plaintiffs have filed an appeal to the judge's ruling, and you are currently scheduled for oral arguments before the D.C. Circuit Court on Monday. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Now, I am surprised in that situation to see Mr. Palmer here at the hearing if you truly want to stay out of the litigation. It seems to me that you are doing just the opposite there, Mr. Chairman. You have been sensitive to this issue before. You were sensitive to it in the Tillman case. You were sensitive to it uh, in the Blackwater employees' case on that. And if you really wanted to be sensitive to it here today, Mr. Palmer would be sitting out in the audience and not at the witness table. And Mr. Palmer, do you have concerns that your participation in this hearing might imply in some way that this committee is trying to support you in your ongoing litigation against the National Mediation Board? No, I would like to respond to your first question as well. Well, I also, also, since I, I have limited time to ask the questions, I am going to ask him and ask you to answer my I under, questions. I understand that. No, I, I want to not. examine your claim that your testimony that the new rules regarding union elections are tilted in favor of unions. We haven't seen any evidence that unions have won any more union elections after the implementation of these new rules. According to the data that the National Mediation Board in this fiscal year, 2011, provided. All right, the following the enactment of the rule change, the National Mediation Board has overseen 31 elections, and the certification rate for the elections under the new rule was basically the same as it had been for the decade prior, raising by exactly one percentage point, from 61.5 percent to 62.5 percent. These elections under the new rules included four elections involving Delta personnel. The unions lost all four of the Delta elections under the new election proceedings. All right, Mr. Chairman, I just want to wind up my comments saying, like, if Mr. Palmer wasn't supposed to be having this committee look like it was coming down on the side of the plaintiffs in that case, he shouldn't be sitting here. They clearly have lost four elections under the new rules. They have not been adversely impacted on that. Mr. Palmer has a direct interest as a plaintiff in that matter. Uh, and I think that we in this committee should be in the business of not interfering with litigation. We should not be putting these matters on here when they are going on. And it would have been entirely appropriate to leave Mr. Palmer on the bench. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I yield. Uh, I know we were going to disagree till the end of this hearing. Uh, our view was that job creators and people impacted were coming here to give their opinions about either rules, proposed rules, uh, or, or other things that they thought was impacting them. We asked Mr. Palmer, and he did so in his opening statement, to limit to his opinion about the effect. Now, I know you are I know you're a baseball fan, so I understand that that if they change the size of the strike box, it may or may not affect differences, but at least as to the pitchers, they would say their job got easier or harder with a rule change. Mr. Palmer is expressing Re an opinion my about time, that. Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time. You can't convince me that in all of the employees, there was 21,000 employees, Mr. Palmer was the only person that could testify with that point of view, and that that was necessary to bring a plaintiff in a lawsuit here to testify with uh, 20,999 others available to be the person to sit on that panel. Uh, my staff, back. For, for the record, my staff indicates that at the time of his invitation, we were not aware he was an intervener, but when we became aware, we chose to go forward, and I appreciate the gentleman's concern. With that, we go to the gentleman who represents my alma mater, Mr. Wahlberg. And always proud to represent Siena Heights, Siena Heights University. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, um, uh, Mr. Palmer, I appreciate you being here, and I want to give you an opportunity to answer a question that, that you did want to answer. Uh, all I would say is I appreciate the efforts of, of Delta uh, and uh, Northwest uh, attendance and crew. Uh, you complete 
every week, at least twice, uh, the object of my grandchildren, and that is to have a safe, safely returned grandfather, because they are the only people in the world that truly adore me. <laughs> so thank you for, for doing that. Um, I am going to ask five questions, uh, at least that is my intention. And so if you could keep your answers as brief as, as possible, but complete as possible, I want to let you end uh, by answering a uh, basic question, any additional points or comments you would like to, to address. But let me go back. Uh, my Democrat uh, colleagues state that the old rules were undemocratic. Uh, and the elections were not how we elect uh, government officials. Uh, how do you respond to that? He was partly right. They, they are democratic, but they are not like we elect you, and they are not like we elect you for s several reasons. If you underperform, then your constituents have a right to vote you out in a period of time. Also, your constituents do not pay you dues. You, um, as I have written in my testimony as well, besides that, I will go here. The in our NLRB, which the NRLA and the NMB wanted to do, there was an equal process to decertify. Once you vote in a union, say Delta or Northwest with AFA, it is for an indefinite term. There is no equal process to go back. There is the convoluted straw man poll that I talked about. You have to get one person out of the 21,000 to be a straw man. We all have to identically sign cards. It has to be 50 percent of us plus one within a year then hold the election and then hope that the person that we are electing to replace the union will actually then step down once and if somehow he wins. So you are so, captured? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Completely different. Uh, assertions have been made that uh, Delta, Delta interfered in the election. Did you experience any interference uh, from the company in any way? I did not. Uh, is there any way for Delta to know how a flight attendant voted in the election? There is not, not. I also had a ballot point. We vote um, online and by phone, which is another difference. We vote for five weeks. We don't vote for 12 hours on one day. You have five weeks to vote. You can vote online or you can vote by phone. That allegation came up from AFA. I contacted ballot point, who coincidentally is who uses, who AFA uses for their internal elections at Northwest. They state that they give us a PIN, random PIN, and a random password. They store those on two separate servers. So once you log in and then place your PIN, I have an email from them stating that not even their engineers could tell you how you voted. And even if they did tell you how you voted, they have no clue who that PIN belonged to. So no. So no they, ballot identification of the voter in any way, shape, or form? No way, shape, or form. Uh, you mentioned that the old rules were consistent with the Railway Labor Act. Uh, can you explain? I can. It was The old rule was it was 50 percent plus one of the majority of the class. So with just a round number, 20,000 flight attendants at Delta, if 10,001 voted, then you would be unionized. They have changed that now to be a minority vote. So if 2,000 vote and 1,001 vote in the affirmative for any, elect any union, not even just AFA, now you have a union for the whole group. So it was completely different. Okay. okay. Uh, ha has the NMB ever been, requ uh, been requested to change the rules before? Yes, they have. Actually, they have been four times, and, and probably the most interesting time was under the Carter administration. They had the exact same board. It is a three-member board. It was one Republican, two Democrats. They were, um, I believe, in the mid-'80s and the late-'70s also asked, and then this last time with the TTD. During the Carter administration, the NMB actually published in their register that they did not believe that they had the right, that it could only go by congressional law. And again, I reiterate, we have two, two Democrats and one Republican now. During the Carter administration, it was the same thing. They refused to change it then. It was refused to be changed in the 60s and refused to be changed in the 80s. 27 seconds. Any additional comments or points you would like to make uh, uh, on this issue that you seem extremely passionate about and is very personal? Well, I think that someone mentioned earlier about that Americans have the right to uh, know the inherent costs to us with regulations. There's $516 of dues each year, plus millions over the course of the year for the unions. We have a right to have that money and know what it's going to be used for. With unions, we do not. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's very easy in a hearing like this to beat up on the executive branch for different problems with regulations. I think Congress needs to remember where the laws come from, and that is us. And oftentimes we fail in our responsibilities to pass good laws. 
So that really makes it harder on the agencies to pass or formulate good regulations. An example I wanted to bring up in particular is the Lacey Act, and I'd like to ask the chairman to amend the report that he's already submitted for the record. Because on page 13 of his document, it says the Lacey Act was last amended in 1981. Well, we amended it in 2008. We added plant species to that act. And a Tennessee company recently has suffered greatly as a result of overzealous enforcement of that act. The law as written by Congress included no grandfathering whatsoever. So it literally puts at risk every serious musician in the United States, not just musical instruments, but flooring, all sorts of industries that have to do with uh, wood products or paper products, things like that. And that was a congressional mistake. I didn't vote for this law. The President actually vetoed it, and Congress went to the trouble of overriding the veto. Now, this law was a very small part of a much larger farm bill, but that shows the risk that we take when we pass a massive piece of legislation, and it's hard to spot the individual components of it. Another flaw with the laws passed by Congress is it puts our legal fate in this country completely in the hands of foreign lawmakers and the way they come up with their laws, which is sometimes hard to detect in one of the, what, 220 countries around the world. So the best way to reform is to start looking in the mirror. And we have a lot of work to do here. It used to be years ago that there were study groups in Congress so that we could actually have a better idea of knowing what we were voting on in advance before the vote. An earlier speaker, Newt Gingrich, banned those organizations, <laughs> and that ban has continued now for a decade or two. So now each one of us has individual staffs that try to keep up with what we are voting on, but it is very difficult for them to do a super professional job the way it used to be done. So perhaps this Congress could look into reinstating those organizations allowing them to form so we could have a much more professional look. The group that I particularly uh, focused on in the past was called the Democratic Study Group, but actually Republicans trusted it so much they subscribed too, because this group did not assume that you would vote with the Democratic Party at all. They just wanted to serve up the facts, give you the pro and con, and then let you make up your mind according to what is in the best interest of your country and your folks back home. That sounds a little old-fashioned, but wouldn't that be nice to return to ideas like that so we would actually have a much more solid idea of what we are voting on? So There is a silver lining in this hearing. I think a couple of the witnesses and most folks on this committee realize that Cass Sunstein is a brilliant individual. I wish he had more clout and more visibility. We are going to hear from him in a little bit. But um, I think he wants to make good things happen to get these cost-benefit analyses right. But it is difficult to reform um, a process overnight. So hopefully with a little goodwill, a little patience, we can start fixing some of these broken things that have been broken for a long time in this town. And I think Congress should start with itself. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I would be lighted. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we take note of the uh, 2008 Act and would ask unanimous consent we would be able to revise the document before submission. Uh, secondly, I appreciate your points, including the unintended consequences to the guitar industry and a number of others. Uh, this committee is cognizant that we have to do review of laws we have passed, and, and I hope that we, we continue to remember that many of the regulations that get created do start with ill-prepared legislation. Uh, and I will take to note, along with the ranking member, if we can uh, address your concerns on the study committees, because I think there are successor study committees, but I would like to know more about what you would like to see, and we will work on that. Thank you, gentlemen. We now go to the gentleman, the other gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjolais. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks to our witnesses for appearing here today. Uh, Mr. Arkish, as I listened to your testimony, it reminded me of a reality TV show that was on, I think, Aston Kutcher. Uh, where you have been punked. And before I spend time asking you questions, I want to make sure you weren't punking us today with that testimony. <laughs> okay. Um, why do you think so many of our companies are going overseas uh, to, to 
create their, their uh, businesses? Oh, well, uh, I am certainly not a multinational corporation myself, so I don't have a lot of personal insight into that. Um, I think a lot of factors go into decisions like that. Okay. Um, have you ever worked for the Office of um, Management and Budget? No, I haven't. Uh, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs? No, I haven't. Um, have you ever headed an executive or independent agency? No, I have not. Um, owned or operated your own small business? Uh, that is a close call. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as part of the Job Creators Tour, I have traveled through Tennessee and, and visited, oh, 30 plus factories and businesses and uh, asked them what was standing in the way to job creation. And, and their opinion is a little different than yours. Uh, probably the number one answer I get is that we need to get government out of the way. And uh, EPA comes up quite often. And so clearly their opinion of regulations differs from yours. Um, do you think that all regulations are good? Oh, no, of course not. Anyone can make mistakes, and that is true of the government as well. And on, those, on the note of what small businesses think, uh, there have been some interesting surveys recently that have shown that the, the number one concern of small businesses is poor sales. The concern is there won't be enough demand for their products. It is not government regulation. Okay. Um, just, just to get this straight, I think you had said that uh, one of the biggest problems for regulatory agencies is that they are overregulated. That is right. Okay. I want to make sure I heard that correctly. Doesn't that in itself suggest that the bureaucrats here in Washington are doing a poor job in terms of overregulating? Um, it suggests to me the contrary. It is that even when there is a common sense rule that they want to write uh, that everyone agrees on, sometimes industry wants rules. Sometimes industry and labor get together and they say to an agency, we need a new rule here. Even in those instances, it is too hard and it takes too long to write a simple non-controversial rule because there are so many administrative burdens on these agencies. I hear a lot of numbers thrown around out there, what regulations cost employers. Uh, I've heard anywhere from nine to twelve thousand dollars per employee just through the sheer number of regulations. Is that a number that sounds about right? Uh, no, it sounds wrong to me. Okay. What do you have a number? Well, I think that number is derived from this uh, study that the uh, by these economists, Crane and Crane, that, that they said that regulations cost the economy $1.75 trillion a year. That, that study has been uh, thoroughly discredited. Uh, it had an incomplete data set. It had a flawed methodology. Uh, it only looked at costs of regulations. It didn't look at benefits. If we looked at everything that way, we wouldn't buy food. I would say, well, my grocery bill is a little high. That's $50 a week. That's a big cost. Well, I don't disagree. Um, some regulations are good. I'm not trying to sound like I'm anti-regulation. But what I'm hearing in the real world from real job creators is that we need to get government out of their way, and they are overburdened. So I, I appreciate your uh, testimony and being a good sport with. I have one real world. Uh, I do have one real world personal response to some of this. The uh, and the Lacey Act concerns. Okay. I actually, am a, the, the way in which I have a small business is I'm a musician, and I actually work in a right. in a band that we play okay. weddings and bar mitzvahs. If you have anyone. Uh, you have it, but uh, uh, but and I'm excuse guitar, me, but I, no, I, no solicitors here. I'm sorry. You know, it, it, if we let actually, it start with you, you'll know, end up with Pepsi cans look, sitting on the. Uh, with all respect, that was a joke. But, uh, uh, but uh, I'm a guitarist, and I don't have concerns about the Lacey Act. It's not okay. a problem for me. It's not a problem for my business. I wanted to get to uh, Mrs. Lavalley uh, for a moment because clearly you, you've got a great story there. In your testimony, in testimony, you indicate that the USDA previously promoted consumer-driven small-scale processing operations. Can you expand on how the new rule uh, now restricts your operation? Certainly. When we go back to the proposed rule, what it says in the proposed language is that it bans packer-to-packer -packer sales, does not differentiate size or anything, nor do I believe that differentiating size is an answer by any means. However, what it says is two-thirds of our animals actually are sold to a, directly to a packer. Under this proposed regulation, it says that those packer-to-packer -packer sales are banned. We are a packer. I am a packer. I am a producer. I am a feeder. I am a rancher. And because I am a packer, I now have limitations on who I can actually sell to because I cannot sell the rest of my animals to another packer. Okay. The Chairman has been quick with the gavel, but I just want to real quickly, uh, if I get my question, maybe he will let you answer. Is it true that GIPS agreed to conduct a more rigorous cost-benefit analysis of the rule in response to the stakeholders' concerns? It is true, and we appreciate that. However, what we would like is that there be that uh, 
be open for review and comment. We know that uh, the original economic analysis was flawed. And so, again, just as you all have said, 147 of you ri have written a letter saying that this process should be open for public comment. We want that to be the case. And we have heard that that won't be the case as far as being open for public comment. That review, that uh, cost-benefit analysis should be open for review and public comment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mrs. Lavalle. I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and the gentlelady. Uh, we now go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for allowing me my opening statement. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Barker, uh, I listened to your testimony, and I have some questions about it, but let me ask um, you make reference to the Lacey Act. Uh, am I not correct that the Lacey Act was introduced in 1900 by a Republican congressman from Iowa and signed into law by a Republican President William McKinley to try to, uh, con well, its original motivation was to try to protect endangered species that were being more than decimated because of the you know, feather trade in women's hats at the time. Is, is that not correct? I am no expert on the, the history of the Lacey Act. Uh, I, I can't respond, sir. Well, that act that has been in, on the books for 111 years, in your view, is, does it represent burdensome regulation that should be repealed? Yes, hmm. at least in some cases, sir. It is okay. a huge act. Thank you. You, uh, you made reference to the USGS study, and I think you said it was very unscientific. This is the study you are referring to? Yes, 302 pages, published in 2009. Um, are you aware of the fact that um, uh, a number of scientists uh, from all over the United States signed a letter praising this study and saying it most certainly is scientific and is relevant and ought to be taken cognizance of as we perform our deliberations. I am referring to a letter you may not have seen. I be glad to share with you to my colleague from Virginia, Bobby Scott, who was then the chairman of the House Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism and Homeland Security on June, uh, January 20th of last year. This letter is signed by PhDs, uh, usually in botany or biology or natural sciences, from Waldorf College, University of Hawaii, University of Tennessee, Florida Museum of Natural History, University of Massachusetts, Texas Tech, Duke University, Central Lakes College, uh, Welder Wildlife Bi Federation, Defenders of Wildlife, uh, Bishop Museum in uh, Hawaii, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Auburn University. Have you seen that letter from these scientists? I don't have it with me here, but yes, I have seen the letter. Most of the signatories on it are people who would be identified professionally as invasion species biologists and mm. colleagues of the authors of that paper. So they are just biased? Some are graduate students of one of the authors. Are you familiar with the testimony given in March of last year to, uh, by the director of the National Park Service before the House Resources Committee? And he, he said, and I quote, the Burmese python is currently well established in South Florida, including Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve, and a population of boa constrictors is established south of Miami. Additionally, recent evidence strongly suggests a reproducing population of northern African pythons on the western boundaries of Miami. He is testifying here that these invasive species, these non-native exotic species, have now, in fact, established themselves in South Florida. Do you take any issue with that testimony? Uh, there are several issues. One is that the Everglades region of South Florida has more established alien species than any other similar ecosystem in the world. One, fully one-third of all plants and animals that have ever been recorded in that area are established alien species. Do you believe that the Federal Government has any obligation whatsoever in concert with the State Government of Florida to try to hold back and, if not, uh, uh, if not uh, actually try to uh, improve progress in, uh, in uh, curbing the, both the introduction of exotic foreign species that could be dangerous to the habitat and to try to make some progress in, in curbing the uh, habitat of the Burmese python and other uh, reptiles? 
I don't know of anyone who's happy about Burmese pythons existing in uh, the Everglades region of South Florida. Um, it, it is a problem, but it is a very localized state problem. It is not a federal problem. It's not, Burmese pythons are not going to spread across the United States and strike fear in the hearts of kindergartners everywhere. It, 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 the, the, uh, um, so in, in this case, I think the Lacey Act is just simply the wrong uh, piece of legislation to, to invoke. And, and I can offer as an example of the, the, the fact that they're not going to, uh, you know, there's a, uh, I disagree with some conclusions in that report and other people support it, but, I, uh, but in terms of actual evidence, over the past 20 years, a significantly larger number of Burmese pythons were imported into the Los Angeles, and there's no established population of the snakes there. They've been maintained in large numbers by tens of thousands of people across the southern United States for 30 and 40 years. I got my first one 41 years ago. I don't have any now, but I, but, but they, uh, but, but it, uh, um, um, there are not there are no other populations anywhere else in the United States, and and uh, I think that Florida has acted very aggressively and very appropriately to handle the problem at the state level. They've done very well, and I will mention that the African rock python that was included in the testimony last year is believed to have been extirpated from the United States. Now it was there were a very small number of animals existing in a huge pile of lumber. Uh, the state came in, wood shipped the whole thing, didn't find any more animals, wiped out the thing. No animals have been reported in 12 months, and they are waiting another year to formally declare them as exterminated. But they appear to be gone. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, uh, who is not going to ask questions at this time. We now go to the gentleman from Texas. Oh, Mr. Gowdy's out. Uh, you sure? We go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farinholt, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And being, uh, being a Texan, a big cattle growing state, I wanted to uh, uh, talk to Ms. LaValle for a second about, uh, about the effort that, that goes into uh, producing cattle. You know, the USDA right now, you know, they grade, uh, select, choice, and prime, and that affects how much you get for your, for your cattle. And can you tell us a little bit about so increasing upon that and creating different markets with specialized uh, specialized product, you know, uh, grass-fed, uh, Angus? I mean, th there is some effort that goes into doing that and the breeds and how, the, how that Can you just give me like a, you know, 30, 45-second background there? Sure. And I, and I appreciate the question. Sixty-two percent, when we look at all of the marketing arrangements in the United States that are incurred by beef cattle producers, are these added value. And the added value is because of the way they are raised or the way they are processed or the, or the quality, meaning that they are either higher quality, closer to grading choice or prime, or that they are, are meeting a consumer demand. Because they are very specific in how they are raised, the processors and packers have rewarded that individual or that ranch by paying a higher premium price because it's closer to what the consumer wants. And so again, that uh, price differentiation between that and just a, a straight uh, animal that's not added any value, there is that price differentiation because of the added value, the added cost, and the added benefit. And the consumer has been the one to benefit with the higher quality and greater eating experience. Right. So, so you all spend some effort to, uh, you will get more money if you sell it to a gourmet restaurant as opposed to a fast food restaurant, is a, is a simple way to put that. Correct. All right. So uh, the, under the GYPSA regulations, uh, tell me what is going to happen to, to, to that sort of business model. Again, when you see the vagueness of the language that you see in the proposed regulation and uh, the increase, the potential for increase in litigation, what you have is the opportunity to actually reduce the the uh, quality contracts, to reduce the ability to capture that market value, to actually uh, get paid for the added benefit. 
And again, the increased litigation will have the USDA with the oversight of, is this price fair? The USDA will be determining what price is fair, not looking at the differences in the quality of animals or the weight differences or the freight differences or anything like that. USDA will be providing that oversight. That oversight will actually increase the uncertainty in the market. And when we have increased, in, increased uncertainty in the market, we have the tendency to go to the lowest common denominator price, which means there will be a rollback in the prices received for the beef cattle industry because there will be not anyone that wants to take the chance because of that increased government intervention and increased potential for litigation. I, I can't imagine any industry that would be happy with the government telling them how and what factors have to be taken into setting their price. That kind of strikes me as going against the fundamental principles that this country was founded on. Now, I, I take it you are not uh, opposed to all USDA regulations. I mean, they need to be in there making sure the packing plants are safe and, you know, traditional grading methods, maybe even some additional grading methods. Is that, would that be a fair statement? That would be a fair statement. Every day there is between two and three USDA reg, uh, um, inspectors in our pa packing plant every day, and we welcome them, we work with them uh, on all of our plans. All right. Uh, I appreciate it very much. You, is there anything you wanted to add about, uh, about I mean, in, are you able to partner well with the uh, with the USDA, I mean, you work well with them on, on most things, is that not correct? We do. We actually do. And again, we, we welcome that partnership in our plant. And we just do not feel that they need to be in the pricing business or the setting of pricing business or uh, have the potential for increased litigation and competition. I would like to just go back to the letter that was referenced that uh, was uh, enter, entered into the record. I want there to be, uh, to be well known that the majority of the groups that signed on to that letter that were in support of the GYPSA uh, regulation were non-producer groups and do not represent the majority of the livestock in the country. So I do want that reflected, that even though there was significant numbers, we have 84 producer groups that represent the majority of uh, the livestock that is produced in this country that are opposed to this regulation. And who, who benefits from, I mean, what, what's the good outcome? Who benefits from this uh, regulation? To me, it just seems anti-competitive. When you, again, when you look at this and when we look at that there is not a clear cost-benefit analysis completed, uh, it will not be the individual that is out there every day producing the livestock. They will not benefit in any way because, again, the price will be rolled back because no one will want to pay a premium for fear of litigation. So no one, whether it's small, medium, or large, no one benefits from having this increased intervention in government litiga and you see, litigation. Do you see a consumer benefit? To me, it seems like it would take away choices. You know, your ability to say, all right, I'm going to do organic beef, or I'm, gonna, I'm just going to raise Angus cattle, or I'm going to just do uh, grass-fed cattle. I, uh, to me, it's just, it, do, you, do you think there is a benefit to consumers there at all? No. We see a, we see a rollback with the consumer choices also in the, in the outcome of this. It is unintended consequences with this GYPSA regulation. All right. Thank you very much. And I will yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five thank minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I may say before I uh, ask my, my question, we are having these regulations. Uh, just as the, the country is recovering uh, from an economic debacle that everyone agrees uh, did not come from the usual market forces, but from the failure to regulate. It produced a whole set of regulations, Dodd-Frank. Uh, and by the way, we were saved from a worse, worse debacle because of regulations that were enacted 75 years ago during the 1930s. Now, uh, I'd like to ask a question about cost-benefit. We know we've had cost-benefit analysis for a very long time. Um, but Mr. Graham uh, makes a very serious charge uh, that there may be, quote, serious and, and systematic flaw in the benefit and cost numbers, and even suggests that uh, the regulatory agencies have their thumb on the scales. Now, I went and asked somebody to bring me the regulations themselves, uh, the regulation at issue itself, uh, Executive Order 13563, 
Uh, it says, in applying these principles, each agency is directed to use the best available techniques to quantify anticipated present and future benefits and costs as accurately as possible. I would like to ask, Mr. Akrosh, are you aware of any basis for this very serious charge, essentially, that the agencies are cheating uh, in, in doing the cost-benefit analysis? Uh, yes and no, um, but perhaps not in the way that Mr. Graham uh, means it. Um, the agencies might try to cheat, might try to put a thumb on the scale one way or the other. Uh, in my view, in the view of my organization, when Mr. Uh, Graham was heading OIRA, uh, the Bush administration and OIRA were putting a thumb on the scale against measuring benefits adequately. Uh, now his view, when he is no longer in the government, is that the Obama administration is putting a thumb on the scale the other way. Um, there are two points here. One is that this just demonstrates how flawed cost-benefit analysis is as a methodology. It is very difficult to uh, measure the costs and the benefits of a lot of very important things in the regulatory process, the value of lives saved, the value of health, the value of clean air, clean water, children's IQ points. Uh, and people can disagree intensely on how to measure those things. Uh, one of, uh, one of uh, Dr. Graham's disagreements with the Obama cost-benefit analysis on fuel economy standards is that he thinks he knows better what the price of gasoline is going to be uh, in 10 or 20 years than the Obama administration does. If he knew that, if any of us could know that, we would be far richer than any of us is. Um, these, are, these are serious, difficult problems that can't be resolved easily. There are political differences over those problems. And what Graham's testimony shows is when he was in charge of OIRA, he knew how to use his institutional power to require agencies to conform to his views. Uh, it doesn't mean that his views are right, and it doesn't mean that the Obama administration is wrong. The second point is it is very difficult for agencies to, to rig the cost-benefit analysis in the manner that Dr. Graham says. It is hard to overstate benefits, and, uh, because, again, they tend to get understated in the, in, in the economic analysis. They are hard to value. But why, are, the why, are they under, how, how, why do they tend to get understated? Uh, because it is so hard to put a price on them. So uh, another, you know, again, it is hard to value the, cost, uh, the, the, the benefit of saving a life. Uh, uh, at the same time, costs frequently are overstated because most of the information that agencies get is from industry. Industry has every incentive to overinflate cost estimates. And uh, we are only looking at the world as it exists today when we look at costs of regulatory compliance. We have no way of factoring in uh, how much compliance costs diminish uh, with new innovations, new efficiencies. Uh, retrospective reviews tend to show uh, that the costs uh, the cost estimates for major regulations were vastly overstated when we look back at them later. Yeah, I, I found a, another section of, of the executive order that uh, welcomes uh, flexible approaches where relevant uh, and feasible, consistent with regulatory objectives. Uh, it says the agency shall identify and consider regulatory approaches that reduce burdens and maintain the flexibility and freedom of choice of the public. And get, then it gives examples, uh, warnings, um, disclosure requirements, information to the public. That would seem to suggest that uh, regulations are more flexible than, than, than uh, has been alleged. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will give the time to Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Graham, uh, the phrase cost-benefit analysis sounds impossible to disagree with, much like shared sacrifice and balanced approach and some other phrases we have heard recently. How could one possibly not agree with a cost-benefit analysis? So my question to you is, can that analysis be gamed or manipulated, and if so, how? Yes, there are a lot of assumptions and inputs that go into a calculation of cost or benefit. Uh, and if you are trying to tell a good story about a regulation, you can try to pick the inputs that make the regulation look good. If you are trying to make the regulation look bad, you can try to pick some that make them look bad. The key role that OMB OIRA has in this process is to review these cost-benefit analysis and make sure that they are reasonably well done. Mr. Arkush, do you agree with one famous law professor by the name of Cass Sunstein who said uh, 
Expensive regulations may well increase prices, reduce wages, and increase unemployment. You agree with him? I am still waiting for Mr. Sunstein to uh, provide the evidence to substantiate that conclusion. So you disagree with him? Well, let me go to his boss, President Obama. There are some rules and regulations that put an unnecessary burden on a business. Is the President right or wrong? I don't doubt that we could imagine there might be some, but the President hasn't. Can you name one? Because no. he said he could come up with 500, 501 if you include his salmon example from the State of the Union. That is right. And the conclusion among uh, consumer groups like mine and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was that the administration didn't find that much. You there just aren't that many overly burdensome, unnecessary regulations. You can't think of a regulations. single solitary rule or regulation that is unnecessary or duplicative. I didn't say I can't think of a single one. Well, name there are, one. There are 500 examples that the President came up with. The President, for example, is going to uh, reduce, they are going to uh, make certain record keeping uh, electronic rather than in paper. That is a great idea. Uh, is that the only no, one you can think of? Uh, I didn't. I didn't come here to, to speak about uh, examples of overly burdensome regulations. When the administration went looking, they found 500 individual ones, well, but none of them this. is very significant. And that is what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce thinks, not just me. If someone were to say we should have no more regulation than the health, safety, and security of the American people require, you agree with that or disagree with that as a standard of review for regulations and rules? I think it's a, it's a reasonable formulation, but it's a little odd. Uh, I don't think that the question is do we have too much regulation or too little. I think it's whether we have the right regulation. Do you know who said that? Uh, I believe that might have been the President of the United States. It was. And uh, let me ask you with respect to a couple of specific examples. Can you tell me how the health, safety, and security of the American people are impacted by the NLRB's new quickie election rules? Uh, I am actually not an expert on those rules at all, but I do know that uh, union membership in this country has declined a lot in the last several Historic decades. Historic low. And that is yes, and that's, uh, and it's correlated with uh, poor income distribution. Uh, it's correlated so with you agree that that rule is calculated solely to drive up union membership? That is what you just said? Uh, absolutely not. That is what you just said. I, I was responding. I was taking for granted. I, I thought that you you were saying it was a a, a pro union rule, and I was taking that for granted in my answer. But you agree that it was calculated solely to drive up union membership. I have no idea. I'm not familiar with the rule. Um, can you tell me how the po the posting of posters informing workers of their right to unionize, but not their right to decertify a union, impacts the health, safety, or security of the American public? Uh, I believe that uh, all Americans should have adequate knowledge about their rights. Including their right to decertify if they are in a union? They should have knowledge of any right that they have. I believe that unions work best when they are democratic. I believe that workplaces work best when they respect their workers and respect uh, the choice to join unions, if that is what So you want. would disagree with and argue against an NLRB rule or regulation that only gave half of a worker's right, the right to unionize, but did not inform them of their right to decertify a union? Uh, you know, in the abstract, I don't know much about these rules, but sound, sure, sounds like, sounds like they should know about their full rights. All right. The redefining of bargaining units, can you tell me how that impacts the health, safety, or security of the American public? I don't even know what you mean by the redefining of bargaining units. Uh, reconstituting who can vote in union elections and the uh, majority necessary to win. How does that impact the health, safety, or security of the American public? I, I would guess that again. I don't know. I'm not familiar with these rules, but I would guess that whoever put them in place has a has a pretty well thought out theory on how it helps. Could it be raising membership in unions? Could that be the well thought out goal? That might be, and that would actually be a laudable goal if it were. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I now recognize uh, the gentleman from New Hampshire. Okay. I will take uh, some of this time. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Gowdy, do you have any other questions? Do you need some additional time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I have exhausted my questions, but thank you for your gracious offer. All right. Dr. Graham, um, would you like to respond to Mr. Arkush? He said that um, he, he took some issue with some of the things that you were saying in your testimony. Uh, I don't know if you took note of those things. If, if you would take the time to, to respond to him. 
Uh, yes, just two factual things for the record. Um, one of his comments was that, was that agencies don't uh, know how to take into account the fact that the costs of regulations sometimes decline over time as industry gets accustomed to them and learns how to comply. But in fact, some of the agencies like EPA build in assumed reductions in costs over time, for example, in compliance with motor vehicle standards. Um, and there are other cases where regulations end up being more costly than anticipated. And, and of course, that needs to be part of the understanding as well. Um, the second thing was my key point on the future of oil prices and gasoline prices is certainly not that I know the future of those prices. I would be a very wealthy person if I could know that much. But my point is, is the agency in good faith analysis needs to consider the possibility that they might actually stabilize and decline over time as that they will continue to rise in the future. And that is due to the, the slowing of the growth of the Chinese and Indian economy and the growing supplies around the world as new discoveries of oil and new technologies to find them are invented. So we just need to take into account both of those possibilities. Okay. Now, as you know, and as was already mentioned, last week the President told a joint session of Congress that we should have no more regulation than the health, safety, and security of the American people require. Every rule should meet that common sense test. Do you believe Federal regulatory agencies are currently meeting this common sense test? I think it is a rule by rule analysis. And I cited one concrete example. Giving special compliance credits for electric cars under the mileage program, it doesn't improve the environment. It doesn't make us any safer. It just allows manufacturers to produce more cars that have lower mileage to offset those. So counting them as zero pollution, when in fact pollution occurs back at the power plant, it doesn't do anything for the health, safety, and the environment of the country. Okay. Uh, how, how would you suggest that we solve this problem? How, how can we get to? Do you have any specific reforms that we could that you could suggest? Well, I'd like to just start with encouraging the members of this committee uh, to look very carefully uh, at the operation of OIRA. Uh, of the amount of activity OIRA is engaged in to improve these analyses. And there are two concrete ways you can do that. One, you can ask OIRA to provide examples of cost-benefit analyses that were changed because of the reviews that OIRAs have done, OIRA has done and how they have been improved. Uh, because after these rules are done, those public documents should be available. There is nothing deliberative about that. Uh, and second of all, you should be asking for examples of regulations that were withdrawn or returned or whatever because of poor quality cost-benefit analysis. Can I, I can assure you, after working six years in the administration and working on these, it is very hard for these couple dozen people in OIRA to keep track of all of these regulations and analyses, and the number of them that are costly is on the rise. It is a very important job that OIRA plays at this time in our American uh, economy. Okay. Thank you. Now, the President and his administration keep saying that they have had less regulatory burden than other past administrations. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, I haven't seen the basis for that claim, no. Now, um, is there a, you spoke about midnight regulations in your testimony. What, can you explain to us what that is? Well, at the end of presidential administrations, at the end of the fourth year or the eighth year, there is a historic pattern that Presidents and their, and their uh, regulators, they like to get out as many of the rules as they can right at the end of the administration. So you see in Republican administrations and Democratic administrations, that last uh, you know, six month period tends to be uh, a place where a lot of these rules are, are, uh, are issued. Now, has the Obama administration been using that? Because we are not at the end, I mean, we're at no, the no, yet I, of his administration. No, and uh, I would be very surprised if this administration is any different than the previous ones. Uh, and that is another example of a time when a strong and vigorous OIRA is very important. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I yield now to the uh, gentlelady from New York. Well, I uh, thank the gentleman for having this important hearing and, and for all of your testimony. We are in several different hearings at once. I regret I was not here, but I did, did read it. And in terms of regulation, um, with the financial crisis, it is really the first uh, financial crisis, uh, I, I, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that was caused by uh, the financial in industry, basically unregulated aspects of the financial industry. And we saw through this crisis that areas that were regulated did not cause the problem. It was unregulated areas of credit default swaps and innovative new products that had no uh, 
regulation in the past. And in fact, I will never forget uh, uh, President Obama, when he came to Wall Street and unveiled his regulatory proposal, he quoted from the paper and he said, uh, uh, many people on Wall Street are upset that these regulations are going to destroy their productivity. And he reads this long uh, statement from the paper, and then he says this is in 1929, 1930, after they created the FDIC, which by all uh, respects uh, performed uh, extremely well to stabilize our markets, protect uh, consumers' uh, deposits, and move forward. So, so I would uh, say that the FDIC was a regulation that helped uh, save uh, uh, our economy in many ways, um, and uh, their ability to uh, wind down companies or to manage them in a way that kept the stability of the financial markets was a plus. Um, for the unregulated areas, Congress had two choices. You could either bail them out, which is a bad choice, or you, should, or you could close them down, an equally bad choice. The FDIC, with the regulatory tools that they were given and in which Dodd-Frank expanded to include the coverage of other uh, areas that were unregulated, you are able to manage it in a way that the shocks to the economy were less. And one of the most uh, riveting testimonies during this time was by Christina Romer, who was the head of the Economic uh, Committee of Advisors. She said the shocks to the American economy during this Great Recession were three times tougher and deeper and stronger than they were during uh, the Great Depression. So in some cases, regulations can save industry and can save our financial markets and can protect consumers. So I would just like to ask, are there any examples where you have seen um, Regulation maybe improve the, uh, the quality of life of Americans, the economic security of Americans. And I would like to ask Mr. Arkush if you could uh, testify. I know that uh, you came out with a report recently in this area, and I found it a very interesting report, and I would like a unanimous consent to put in the record the report that was done by a public citizen, if, uh, there's any, if that would be appropriate. Without objection. Thank you very much. So can you give us some examples where regulation has actually been helpful in making our water cleaner, our air cleaner, our appliances work safer, sure. or that your money that you deposit in a bank might actually be there and not be uh, removed or lost so that there is economic security for American families? Thank you. Sure. There is there's obviously a vast number of regulations that protect our air, our water, uh, the safety of our deposits in banks. Uh, the report that we issued yesterday was talking about uh, regulations that not only did those types of things, but also spurred innovation in the industries that they applied to. Um, so, for example, uh, when the EPA decided to phase out CFCs in aerosol because uh, CFCs were harmful to the ozone layer, industry protested. Uh, made the usual arguments about how this would kill millions of jobs, it would put you know, an entire sector out of business. Um, but when it finally came down to it, the day after EPA finalized its rule, the very next day, the inventor of the original aerosol uh, announced that he would come up with a solution. And it actually turned out it was not a problem to comply with this, uh, this great regulation which uh, prevented the destruction of the ozone layer. Uh, another example was when OSHA uh, moved to uh, phase out vinyl chloride, a harmful uh, a carcinogen, uh, from the workplace. Uh, manufacturers of PVC pipes said this would destroy their uh, industry and, and cost uh, lots of jobs. Um, but uh, within three months of the finalization of the rule, a company came up with a new manufacturing profit process for PVC pipe that uh, was more efficient, allowed the companies to comply with the rule, and uh, didn't require them to kill the manufacturing workers. Well, my time has expired, but I think if we are going to discuss the impact of regulations on jobs, shouldn't we also include information about their economic and social benefits, including whether they actually may create new products, new jobs, or protect uh, the American citizens and the American economy, as they have done in terms of uh, the deposit system? And, and other areas. Um, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, 
I will now yield to uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I yield back my time to the chair. Thank you. And I will take that time. Uh, Mr. Barker, how would, you, how would the proposed rule banning the importation and interstate trade of snakes affect your business? It, 90 percent of my business is interstate and a, a, a smaller percentage is international, and the Lacey Act stops that. The animals can't be crossed across state lines under any circumstances, and it is a felony to do so. So whether I sell them or my customer gets them and then he, uh, whatever, they just can't be moved across state lines. And does that affect any other businesses as well? Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, my industry is tightly interconnected with uh, many, many other large and small businesses. My wife and I spend a lot of money at Home Depot. We spend a lot of money with Delta Air Cargo. We spend a lot of money with FedEx. Uh, we buy snake cages and they in turn buy stainless steel, plastics, glass, whatever. We buy rats. The rat breeders invest in cages. The rat breeders buy food. They buy gr the grain mills buy grain from. Uh, it is not. Uh, people who don't like snakes or don't know about snakes don't realize how widespread it is and how interconnected it is and how many people do it. Thank you. I am not a big fan of the snakes, but that is <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Graham. Um, you just heard the, the gentlelady from New York talking about um, how we need, needed to also discuss the, the benefits of, of regulation. And I am always confused when I hear that, because I think that is implicit in the term cost-benefit analysis. I mean, isn't that what we are asking? We are not asking to only look at the cost of regulation. We are asking to look at both. Isn't that correct? Yes. And when I teach my students, I use the phrase benefit-cost analysis. Mm -hmm because I tell them that B has the alphabetical advantage, <laughs> and it is to reminding people that benefits are important as well as costs. So you are not here to say that there are no benefits to regulation? No, there are often quite substantial benefits. Okay. So, Mr. Arkush, uh, I am going to ask you a few questions. I, I looked at your impressive resume, and, and you have some great experience in academia. You went to some great lo uh, law schools. Uh, how much experience have you had in the private sector? Uh, well, I've worked. I've had many jobs, mm -hmm. and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm actually in a in a, in a band. band. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. we work. Um, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Um, how how many employees have you had in your life? Uh, I've never uh, had a, a full time employee myself. So how can you sit here with all these uh, job makers and say that there is no cost? To, to the regulatory burden that, that their jobs have. Oh, I, I certainly never said there was no cost. Okay, so you are saying, you said that there is not a single regulation that you can think of that, that is bad. Is that correct? Well, uh, that is right, not off the top of my head. And in fact, today I think we have only heard, uh, all we have heard is uh, repetition about two or three specific examples. Uh, but we have had hundreds of hearings head. about uh, regulations, um, and I think there are numerous regulations that, that are bad. But actually, your testimony today actually contradicts what, what you are saying. Um, you, you tell us that it was the failure to regulate that created a lot of the problems, but then you said something that I actually agreed with, but I don't think you realized what you were saying. You said that there is too much, there is not too much or too little regulation. Sometimes the problem is that we don't have the right regulation. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Well, if there is too, not too much or too little, it means that some of our regulations are actually not correct, not the ones taking care of the problem. So the problem is not that we don't have regulation. The problem is that we don't have the right regulation in some instances, correct? That is sometimes right. Absolutely. So wouldn't by implication that mean that some of the regulations that we have right now are bad? I, I don't doubt that there, that there are some. I, I just, off the top of my head, I don't have examples for you. And, 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 and no one else has provided examples today either, I might point out, except for, the, the, uh, except for GYPSA and an NLRB rule and the Lacey Act. Yeah, because these are, the, these are things that we are uh, testifying about today. Well, uh, the hearings about the overall broken process and why at least the flawed regulations, only three have been mentioned. And, and we have a whole report that has been in, entered into the record. How many pages? It is 30 pages of yeah. regulations um, that, that actually affect. And I, I, just, I just think, you know, when we talk about regulations, we have a problem um, because people like yourself come in here and say that there is no problem with the regulatory burden. But at the same time, they are not willing to look at regulations that are maybe outdated, that maybe we should just get rid of, because they are actually uh, 
hurting the, the economy. They are hurting us. And, and you are not willing to look at any of those things. No, I am absolutely, I, I am absolutely willing to concede that there, obviously there could be and there probably are somewhere out there regulations that are unnecessary or, uh, or burdensome. But, uh, but we should talk about them specifically, and I think we ought to fix them where they are. But the overwhelming weight of the evidence is that regulations are, are wildly beneficial. They have returned a, a 700 percent rate of return for us. You know, and, and the most ironic thing about your testimony was in the end, your last line in your testimony, Congress should get to work on reducing the unnecessary burdens placed on the agencies that protect our health and environment. And it is just really beyond the pale that for me to think that you're, you think it is more important for Congress to reduce the burden on, on regulators than it is to reduce the burden on job creators. But I will, my time has expired, and I will now yield. Now it is my time. And I will yield. Would my the gentleman time. yield? Absolutely. <laughs> I thank the chairman. <laughs> I'm back. Uh, I'm going to ask just a, a final round, and I appreciate the, your patience and your dialogue here. But I'm going to ask something that uh, I think crosses all of you. Uh, some of you are very young. Some of you are a little more like me, a little less young, and you know, some of you are in between. But I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, in the uh, in the 50s and 60s. So I grew up at a time in which we were an industrial capital: auto, steel, and rubber. Plenty of coal still burning. My grandmother actually burned coal in a plain old-fashioned big thing down in the basement that just hot air rose through the house. Our buildings were black. And it wasn't until they really cleaned up the city years and years later that it was worth cleaning them off and showing the stone underneath. So I'm somebody who has appreciated clean air, clean water improvements. Uh, but I also have seen that Cleveland no longer produces cars, less engines, no rubber, you know, no tires. Uh, steel mills are pretty well gone and so on. So I see the balance. I want to ask you a, a, a fairly simple question. And, Mr. Uh, Arkish, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. If, in fact, regulations individually all do good things, but the price of getting cleaner air and cleaner water and less pesticides and everything else that we would like to have as goals, and certainly not losing species and so on. If the price is that our unemployment rate goes from 9 percent to 10 percent to 11 percent to 14 percent, because simply the jobs created by being competitive around the world are diminished and transferred to outside the country, are we better off? Or isn't there a balance that this committee and the regulatory regimen have to make sure are balanced of full employment? competitiveness and clean air, clean water, safety and the like? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is the most difficult challenge facing, facing you and facing the regulators, obviously, when there is a, when there's a difficult decision to be made between uh, uh, economic costs or jobs and, and protecting the public. Fortunately, what the evidence shows is the cost just doesn't come up. Or that, 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 that question isn't often posed uh, by the regulations that our agencies produce. They overwhelmingly have benefits that, that outweigh the costs, even though the costs are much easier to quantify than but, the benefits. And I appreciate that. I want to follow up with you quickly. When you say cost and benefits, the current benefits are, and, and Mr. Dr. Graham, I'm sure, can help with us with this, the benefits are not necessarily global competitiveness. In other words, you can cumulatively have benefits and cumulatively become less competitive and thus lose jobs, can't you? Uh, and I think the attempt is to, to incorporate everything into the equation. Dr. Graham, you were you are not still at OMB, but were you able to do that? During the Bush administration, there were increases in regulations, not quite at the rate that they are going now, but there were a lot of increases. And we began continued losing our competitive edge against the rest of the world. Isn't that true? Well, let me start by saying I am a born and raised Pittsburgher uh, family in the, in the steel industry. So you have got no sympathy, be, being that you were from the uh, poor cousin of the Cleveland Browns. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I think that the, the, uh, the demise of industry in cities like Pittsburgh and Cleveland has a complicated history and terrain, and um, it has elements of uh, not adequate technology, it has elements of labor cost, it has elements of regulation. All of this is in the story. 
Um, but one thing to remember is when we do these cost-benefit analyses, is we do them, the analyses one at a time on individual regulations. What happens, however, is when you have a suite of regulations that simultaneously hit the same sector, it's hard when we do cost-benefit analysis to handle kind of the, the combination of that. And there are certain sectors in our economy, and steel is certainly among them, autos is among them, mining is among them. They are really under a lot of logging. Logging would be another example. And we should be uh, candid about the fact that when we do individual cost-benefit analyses of individual rules, we don't necessarily capture that, that combination. One final point. These, these huge benefits uh, that you are hearing about from um, Mr. Arkush's testimony, what he is doing, he is taking some really wonderful regulations clean air examples or automotive safety examples, he is combining them with a bunch of other regulations which aren't so great, and he is saying the overall benefits are greater than the overall cost. Well, that is true. But that we, we shouldn't defend all of the weak or bad regulations on the grounds that there are some really great ones out there. Uh, and and that is why it is important to look at this uh, as analytically as we can. I want to just close by, uh, by noting something, Dr. Graham, that you had in, in your opening statement. I am deeply concerned that the CAFE standard change was done the way it was because of process. I am also deeply concerned that if we fudge the, the, the numbers so that an electric car gets considered to have, to have be, if you will, no pollution, well, in fact, it is fed maybe by a coal-fired uh, electric plant, that what we are doing is forcing ourselves into one solution that may not be as good as a enhanced diesel, a hybrid, or uh, even a conventional car, or for that matter, compressed natural gas, lots of other solutions. So, uh, in closing, I appreciate the indulgence, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the next panel. And thank you. Thank you very much. And now we would like to excuse the panel. We thank you for being here, and we're just going to recess for a few minutes. Thanks.
committee will come back to order. We now recognize our second panel. The Honorable Cass Sunstein is the current Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs within the Office of Management and Budget, and we are very delighted to have you here today. Uh, pursuant to the committee rules, we would appreciate if you would rise to take the oath. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect the witness is answered in the affirmative. Administrator, you were here for the first panel, and I appreciate your, your being here for that entire time. I also appreciate your additional comments that uh, have been made and, and, and your cooperation throughout this process. Uh, you are a single witness. We are not going to hold you to exactly five minutes, but come as close as you can. And with that, the gentleman is recognized. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to have the chance to appear before you to discuss issues relating to regulation and regulatory review. And I am especially grateful to you, Mr. Chairman, and to the committee as a whole for its uh, constructive and important work on this issue over the past months. It is uh, very uh, significant to try to get regulation in, in a place where it is helpful to the economic recovery. Uh, in the last eight months, much of our work at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has focused on the recent executive order on regulation and especially on the requirement of retrospective analysis of existing rules. My written statement deals with the 500 reform proposals that have now been released to the public and the associated economic savings, which are in the billions of dollars. Uh, it is my belief that these reform initiatives and this general enterprise, which is ongoing, is consistent with the uh, thrust of this particular hearing and the uh, policy goals that are uh, shared on a bipartisan basis. Uh, in these oral remarks, what I am going to do is focus on three topics. First, the basic process of review under our executive orders. Second, the role of the Regulatory Flexibility Act focused on small businesses. And third, an issue that has been discussed a great deal in the last six months, that is the relationship between OIRA and the independent regulatory agencies. Since 1993, under President Clinton, Executive, 1 to, uh, executive Order 12866 has established governing principles, requirements, and processes. It builds, incidentally, on an executive order from President Reagan in 1981, which set out the fundamental charter, which continues to this day. Uh, as stated in the 1993 executive order, and to the extent permitted by law, agencies must propose or adopt a regulation only upon the reasoned determination that its benefits justify its costs a clear endorsement of cost-benefit analysis, second, tailor its regulations to impose the least burden on society, third, select among alternatives the approach that maximizes net benefits, and fifth, identify and assess available alternatives to direct regulation. More freedom uh, uh, should be allowed if it is uh, uh, consistent with law. The same executive order establishes the process of centralized review in which proposed and final significant rules are submitted to OIRA for an interagency process in which different components of the Federal Government comment on the rule that the agency proposes. OIRA is also available, and I would like to underline this point, during the process to meet with anyone who wants to discuss regulations under review including people who were on the previous panel. The meetings may involve business organizations, state and local governments, or congressional staff, and we have had some important ones in all of those domains over the last few years. In the vast majority of cases, the proposed or final rule is changed as a result of these processes. If the draft final rule follows public notice and comment, as is the case typically, then much of the attention of review is on public comments and concerns. In the recent past, those comments and concerns have led to fundamental rethinking of regulatory proposals. There has been some discussion of the number of rules, and uh, we very much appreciate the concern of that excessive numbers. I would like to note, just as a supplemental point, that the number of rules issued in our first two years that have gone through our office is actually lower than the number in the previous two years under President Bush, and indeed is lower than the average, at least in the second term, of the Bush administration. 
Okay. Uh, the interests of small business in particular are uh, protected by the Regulatory Flexibility Act. The Office of Advocacy of the Small Business Administration plays a crucial role in ensuring adherence to that statute, and OIRA works very closely with that office to protect small business against unjustified rules. Of special note is that office's statement from just this year, just a few months ago. As a result of improvements to the RFA, advocacy's work of small business uh, on small business's behalf has required greater involvement in Federal rulemaking. The Office has had more success in urging burden-reducing initiatives, and there is a list where the Office of Advocacy has had that greater success. In short, the trend is going in the right direction. As you are aware, independent regulatory agencies under both Democratic and Republican Presidents have not been covered by the regulatory review process out of respect for the legal independence of those agencies. Nonetheless, President Obama, with the enthusiastic endorsement I know of many on both sides of the aisle, took a significant and novel step with a different executive order which states that independent agencies should follow the cost-reducing requirements of our executive order and should engage in the process of retrospective review. Our hope is that as a consequence, a direct consequence, the Nation will see significant improvements and significant savings, significant reductions in regulatory burdens. We are encouraged by the early results from the independent agencies. Uh, with that said, I am looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you. And, uh because Mr. Gowdy has a crucial other committee at work, I would yield first to Mr. Gowdy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for your testimony. Uh, this is actually not a trick question. Um, I will read you the same quote I read to the first panel. We should have no more regulation than the health, safety, and security of the American people require. Uh, that was a quote from the President. Do you agree with that? I agree with my boss. That is why I said it wasn't a trick question. I am not trying to get anybody in trouble. At 9.2 percent unemployment, I don't want to add to it. Uh, is there anything that should have been added to that, to that series? Health, safety, security, I think it is pretty comprehensive. Do you know or are you familiar with someone by the name of Dudley Butler? I do not know that name offhand. If he were uh, an administrator, either past or present, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Grain Inspection, Packers and Stockyards Administration. There would be no reason for you to know him, I don't imagine. But, and you don't have to know him to be able to answer my question. He referred to a proposed rule as a plaintiff lawyer's dream. Would you agree that that is not an appropriate factor to be considered in the promulgation of a rule or regulation? I wouldn't want to say anything negative about a colleague whom, whom I don't know and who's, uh, for which I don't know the context exactly. Uh, uh, I, I would say, in general, uh, the question is whether regulation conforms to the law and existing executive orders, and the question is not whether it's someone's dream. Uh, Violations of rules and regulations, are they ever considered evidence of negligence in civil litigation? Uh, that is possible. It depends on the context. Violations of rules and regulations, are they ever considered negligence per se in civil litigation? You know, I would want to bone up on my tort law, but uh, it wouldn't be stunning if the answer were yes. So an ancillary reason to be concerned about what some perceive to be the excessive promulgation of rules and regulations would be that it contributes to what some believe is an already litigious society. Uh, this is a very important question, the relationship between Federal regulation and tort law. And uh, you are you're on to something, if I may say, that it would be very valuable for all of us to, uh, to have clarity on that uh, sometimes what happens is a regulation displaces State tort law, it eliminates it. Sometimes it, as, as your question suggests, it kind of puts State tort law on steroids because it gives a, a tool 
the, to the plaintiff that didn't exist before, and whether the, the preemption or the, uh, let's say, enhancement of State tort law is desirable very much depends on the context. I, I do take your point that there are contexts in which the amplification of the civil liability system that the regulation, let's call it the nonpreemptive regulation, creates uh, uh, can be harmful. There are such situations. Are you familiar with and do you support, in theory, the RAINS Act, which is pending in the House? Uh, I, I am familiar with that. The, uh, the administration agrees with the cost reduction goals of the advocates of the RAINS Act. The administration does not favor the RAINS Act on the ground that the tool it gives to Congress, Congress already has to eliminate rules, and that there is a risk that the RAINS Act would have unintended consequences. Just to give you one example, uh, when I last looked at the text, it would sweep up deregulatory initiatives in its ambit, and so our efforts to eliminate costly rules would be delayed and uh, uh, possibly indefinitely by the, 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 this new and, uh, and uh, um, a uh, very dramatic departure from longstanding practice. Do you agree in general that Congress has abdicated its responsibility for uh, filling in the details of legislation to executive branch entities? Well, I, I wouldn't want to make a general statement on that, because there are many laws, as you know, which are quite detailed and prescriptive where the executive has uh, exceeding little, little discretion. There are others where, where, where it has large discretion. And in those cases in which it has large discretion, whether it is an abdication or a recognition of changing circumstances or the need for technical expertise, de depends on the area. I, I, I do understand that many people on both sides of the aisle have been concerned about excessive delegation under some statutes. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking member and would ask unanimous consent that he have one additional minute. I shorted or excessed myself at the end. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There is a lot of rhetoric in the committee and on the House floor describing regulations as job killers. And, um, but regulations uh, perform a critical role in implementing some of our most important laws, such as the Clean Air Act. EPA estimates that in 2010 alone, the Clean Air Act prevented over 160,000 160, premature deaths. And those are real people who are alive today because of these protections. Majority Leader Cantor sent a memo to House Republicans on August the 29th laying out the Republican leadership's agenda for the fall. The memo identifies a list of agency rules the Republican leadership wants to eliminate. These include rules aimed at protecting public health, the environment, and workers' rights. Mr. Cantor's memo makes assertions about the cost of these rules, but does not discuss the benefits. Mr. Sunshine, shouldn't any evaluation of an agency rule include analysis of the benefits the rule provides? Absolutely, yes. Of course, I believe we can always improve regulations to make them better. In fact, the President issued an executive order in January that required agencies to review existing regulations and streamline them when appropriate. In response, agencies developed draft plans in May, and the public was given the opportunity to comment on those plans. As you highlighted in your testimony, those plans include over 500 initiatives that are expected to save more than $6 billion over the next five years. I understand that the agencies were tasked with developing these plans while considering both the costs and benefits of these rules. How were they able to find such significant savings while still ensuring the health, safety and protections provided by these rules? Was, were they just outdated? Did circumstances change? Right. Uh, um, did, did, did any of them have uh, anything to do with new technology? then making them obsolete. Uh, tell us about that, because I think that can provide us guidance with regard to what we are trying to do, and that is strike a balance between making sure that we have rules that we really need to protect the health, welfare, and the safety of Americans, 
but at the same time, get rid of those that just don't make sense anymore? It is a great question, and at some, Thank point, you. at some point probably a book will be written about how agencies were able to identify so many reforms and the $6 billion figure identify. I think we are going to be able to do a lot better than that. That is just a small fraction of the 500 reforms. Uh, let me give you an example by way of getting into your question. The EPA has actually proposed to eliminate uh, tens of millions in, of dollars in annual expense put on small business owners because of air pollution requirements for gas stations, which are not helpful because modern cars already control the air pollution. They don't need the gas stations to do it, so it is completely redundant. That is a case where the rule, when issued, at least for all I know, was served a function, but it doesn't serve a function anymore. And there are other regulations like that where, at the origin, uh, it made some sense but the technology, as you say, has evolved. Some of the savings involve just learning from experience. For example, we have uh, OSHA eliminating 1.9 million hours in paperwork and reporting requirements imposed on employers. OSHA has learned that those aren't helping worker safety. They are providing some information, but it is not information that the government needs in order to do its job. So that is when you learn, and I am excited about this for our future uh, unbreaking uh, those aspects of the regulatory system that are working so well, just learning how things are operating on the ground. Uh, there are other things, and this is maybe relevant to your job, where a, rule, a, a law as enacted may overshoot a bit because the text may sweep up conduct that doesn't really cause the harms that the, rule, that the law is designed to prevent. So we have an oil spill rule, which is uh, serving important functions, but the definition of oil turned out to include milk. Well, uh, the, there's, uh, there's a difference between milk and oil in terms of environmental harm, and a lot of work had to be done to exempt milk and, and dairy industry from onerous regulatory requirements. Uh, because Congress got alert to the problem, it gave EPA the authority to fix it. It took a while to fix it, and with the President's action, it got fixed in a hurry. There are other categories of things where there are compliance dates, for example, or requirements that are issued in one year, which when the relevant year comes around, it just doesn't make much sense anymore, given the economic situation. And so you may have noticed, it got a lot of publicity, that states and localities all over the country were asked, and this was by the Bush administration acting in good faith, to change their street signs and traffic controls. By the time the compliance date came along, there is new font size requires, and states and localities are saying, you are asking us to spend millions of dollars when there is not an ascertainable safety benefit. And the Secretary of Transportation, Secretary LaHood, uh, was very concerned and thought, you know, given our current situation, uh, this is not what states and localities have to do. So we propose to take away that multimillion dollar burden. Well, the method that is being used to get to those kinds of uh, situations that you just stated. And, and it's, I guess it is like a screening process, like when you are, uh, you know, it is like you got tea and you, you got to pour through the tea to get what you want, but you don't want to, you want to keep something there. Uh, strainer. Right. Uh, do we have a sufficient strainer? You understand what I am saying? In other words, are we catching? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like we have the, we put together the mechanisms to catch? Is this in my six minutes? Yeah. No, you're right. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I, I, I don't have an abstract answer to that question, but I do think that it is often the case that laws, like regulations, have unintended adverse consequences, including unintended coverage. Mm -hmm. And what we found with our look-back process, and not infrequently with our notice and comment process, is that if we just listen to people mm -hmm. uh, who are running businesses mm -hmm. uh, or otherwise affected by our rules, they can tell us things that can uh, help create a good strainer. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Walbert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I, think, uh, I thank you for being here, Mr. Sunstein. And uh, two issues I want to address with you, the first being GYPSA. Uh, and and I, I take that in, in reference to uh, a point that uh, Representative Gowdy was attempting to get out. And, you appropriately chose not to answer based upon a, 
uh, colleagues' statements that uh, you clearly weren't aware of. But I do want, for the record, to make sure that we understand in, in relation to this GIPSA question uh, and the fact uh, of being a former member of the House Ag Committee that passed the 2008 Farm Bill and did a lot of work on making sure that that issue, uh, GIPSA, was covered well and regulations were put in place realistically. And a concern now that, uh, that um, uh, USDA and GIPSA have gone well beyond the intent of Congress in, in those, uh, that proposal and the, those regulations. Um, Mr. Dudley Butler, J. Dudley Butler, uh, in, in commenting about the rule and its ability to allow for more litigation in the future, he said this, he said, and I quote, when you have a term like unfair, unreasonable, or undue prejudice, that is a plaintiff lawyer's dream. We can get in front, and that is my concern, we, we can get in front of a jury with that. We won't get thrown out on what we call summary judgment because that is a jury question. Uh, I think you would uh, justifi justifiably understand our concern uh, when a regulator makes that type of statement in relationship to, to GIPSA. Let me go on and ask a question here. Um, as, you, as you may know, multiple studies have been released questioning the economic impact of the proposed rule and what it would, what it would be doing uh, and, and, and the cost that there would be there, which would result to more than $100 million. Um, will you consider having the rule withdrawn and having the USDA initiate a more thorough economic impact study before going forward? Well, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, if the rule has uh, $100 million in annual impact, then it is required to have an economic analysis associated with it. So that is just you know, simple and straightforward. And if originally a rule comes in, in answer to the Chairman's question, it originally it was proposed, didn't look like it would have $100 million, and then it turns out it is going to then at the final stage it has to have that analysis. So even though initially it looked like the, the study that was done was done in a cursory fashion to make sure that it didn't cross the $100 million uh, level, if it ultimately shows that it is going to be more, you are telling me that there will indeed There will be a regulatory impact analysis, okay. with will in italics. Well, we, will <laughs> we will certainly look for that. Let me move forward here uh, on the silica issue. Um, and I, I chair a subcommittee that, that deals with MSHA. And uh, a lot of minds are concerned, and farmers and others, uh, because sand is certainly, as you know, everywhere. Um, uh, currently, OIRA, OIRA is, is reviewing OSHA's proposed changes to the silica standard. Um, this proposal has been under review for almost six months, and I appreciate the fact that it is still under review and has not come out. Uh, because if it were to come out, there are some significant concerns on my part. On August 18, 2011, I copied OMB on a letter asking OSHA to publish uh, an advance notice of proposal rulemaking in order to allow for stakeholders to understand what changes are being contemplated. I await that response. In that letter, uh, I noted that the cost estimated of lowering this standard would be between three to five billion dollars by a small business panel in 2003 that looked into it. Additionally, the lowering of the standard, uh, which has been effective so far in that silicosis is going down, it is not going up. Um, in low, in, uh, the lowering of the standard by half, which is what many in the affected industries are expecting, would effectively lower the limit to be virtually impossible to enforce. Uh, can you explain how IRA is reviewing the proposed regulation and its impact on job creation? Yes, I am pleased to do that. I, I, I should avoid discussing the details of the particular rule under review, but I can tell you some general principles that bear on all rules. Uh, the first is conformity to law. Uh, that is our number one uh, priority. That is the foundation. And uh, there are requirements in the Occupational Safety and Health Act, including feasibility requirements that uh, would be relevant to any OSHA rule and many other agencies' rules which have a feasibility or achievability uh, uh, constraint built into the law. Uh, 
apart from the law, there is the executive order, uh, which requires uh, quantification uh, to the extent feasible of, of all costs and benefits that bears on the rules discussed earlier, as well as this one. Uh, within the constraints of the law, there are principles that the new executive order has in it, uh, including public participation, uh, engagement with uh, relevant stakeholders, an open exchange of ideas, uh, flexibility, uh, meaning give people uh, room to maneuver, because that tends to make economic sense. It also promotes freedom. That is uh, in our executive order. So uh, the law would be the first requirement. Our executive order would set the second uh, level of, uh, of details for analysis. Within the framework of the executive order, uh, probably the most important point here to emphasize is even when a rule is under review, before it is proposed for comment, and this hasn't been proposed for comment, uh, people's concerns uh, are very welcome in the form of uh, meetings as well as letters. So we have had a number of meeting requests on this one in which relevant information has been provided, and that uh, definitely plays a role in the review process. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the longtime businessman, job creator, and congressman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thanks for the uh, longtime job creator. It has been the family business for 57 years. So, Professor, it is nice to have you with us again, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Graham talked about was that the bureaucrats in EPA and, and NASA artificially inflated the benefits of their CAFE and greenhouse gas rulemakings for both light duty and heavy duty cars and trucks by declaring that society would enjoy a social benefit from tighter mileage standards and assigning it a savings of anywhere from $21 to $45 for each ton of carbon not admitted. Did the agencies present any type of science to back that up? Yes. That, that number uh, is a result of a very lengthy uh, report that reflected the views of the Council of Economic Advisors, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, Department of Transportation, the Department of Commerce as well as the Office of Man Management and Budget. And any report that gets consensus from that uh, diverse set of uh, officials either would say nothing or be maybe pretty solid. Okay. So, so th and that range then from $21 to $45 a ton, that is a pretty big range for all those people that weighed in on it. Yes. It actually is, is a somewhat larger range where the $21 is the central value, but at the low end it goes below, well below 21 and at the high end it goes into the 60s. Yeah. I, and, and I, you know, earlier one of our colleagues from Virginia was talking about had the American auto manufacturers not found an end run to get around the CAFE standards in the 70s, uh, that they would not have faced some of the challenges they had. Uh, and I, you know, I, I was actually selling cars during that time period. Uh, CAFE standards really don't drive the market. The price of gasoline does. Uh, and I remember that very specifically, that whatever our standard was at that time wasn't really based on market conditions. It's, again, based on standards that somebody came up with that they thought would be better than what we were currently doing with the concern for we were running out of this fuel. And I can remember a, a Newsweek with the needle being on E and saying we are running out of this and we are running out of that. And, and a lot of that stuff is, has, since then, we are finding out that we do have vast stores of oil. We do have an awful lot available to us. But I am always perplexed. And you said, and I thought this was very good, you said we need to listen to the people who actually run these businesses. And I would agree with that. And I am a guy that is uh, a General Motors dealer. I'm trying to understand a Chevy Volt. If it has such a great value and is such a significant part of our transportation strategies go forward, uh, it should pretty much sell itself. And the fact that General Motors isn't putting a rebate on it, but the American taxpayers are putting $7,500 into every Volt that's sold, and these are not being bought and snapped up by people who say, boy, this is a great car for me to own. This is something I'm going to run out to the dealership and buy. I mean, we're being asked to take this car and stock it, uh, which is a poor business practice. I usually don't like to have anything on my shelf that I can't turn in 45 or 60 days. It's kind of led into our family being able to survive for 60 years in the business. But I have people telling me, no, no, you have to stock this. You don't understand. This is the way the market is going. And I'm trying to understand, because your comment, listen to the people who run these businesses. Where in the world 
Do we get a chance to do that? There are a couple of ways, and one thing we are really trying to do is to spur this at, uh, at our little office, which is uh, when we have a rule under review, uh, sometimes it will have been proposed formally to the public so people have a good sense of w what it might look like. Uh, GIPSA is an example of that. That has been formally proposed. When it is at Well, if we could, and I understand those, but when, when we are talking about transportation, and most of us at some time in our life actually go into a car dealership and sit down, pick out a car and negotiate the price and then buy it. So I am not getting into the silicons and everything else. I am talking about specifically who were the people that were involved in coming up with some of this great strategy as to what we should be driving in the future. With respect to the fuel economy? With respect to the people who buy these, because at some point we are legislating and we are regulating people out of the market. We are raising the prices of transportation, personal transportation, so high that their only, their only choice is being going to be public transportation and finding another way to get from point A to point B. And we are going to drive them from their, their suburban settings back into their urban settings because they can't get there effectively. And that really does concern me, again, government picking and choosing the way we will choose our personal transportation. Okay. Well, before any rule that involves uh, automobiles is finalized, and the one you are referring to is an example, uh, it is presented to the public for comments. And if uh, automobile companies or automobile deal dealers have a problem with it, that plays uh, a But that is that's actually not true, and you know that is not true. No, no, no. It is it's the government decides what the cafe is going to be, what the gas mileage is going to be, and then holds the car manufacturers hostage in order to meet these regulations. The cost of building these vehicles, by the way, is going to be so burdensome that public transport or private transportation as we know it is no longer going to be viable. We know that. No, the public does not weigh in on this. This is, a, this is really, when you talk about overregulation in, in, a, in a government that wields its weight way too much, that is exactly what is happening in private transportation. And I would suggest that this country, which is built on private transportation, needs to take a look at what is happening. I thank the gentleman. And I thank you, sir. I yield back. Thank you. We now go to another past job creator, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. Sunstein, thank you for your hard work. You have taken on a, a very difficult task of weeding out some of these regulations. I think you are working with a scalpel. If you are not successful pretty soon, I think we are going to come in after you with a machete, because <laughs> uh, I think it is something that needs to be taken care of. I want to start off by addressing something of particular uh, interest to the State of Texas, uh, and that is specifically the cross-state air pollution rule. Uh, and this is a symptom that we are seeing uh, on multiple occasions in Texas. We saw it. Uh, with the dune sagebrush lizard, where Texas is not originally included in the original proposals and not given an opportunity to, uh, to take part in the rulemaking process. And then as the final rule comes out or is about to come out, all of a sudden we are, uh, we are thrown in there. Um, and it was about a month ago, uh, the I think the, almost the entire Texas delegation uh, sent you a letter with respect to uh, these uh, cross-state air pollution rules. Have you had a chance to, uh, to read that letter and, uh, and follow up on your offer maybe to uh, yeah. help us out on that? Well, yes, definitely. That, that letter followed a discussion I had with almost the entire Texas delegation, both Democrats and Republicans. And subsequent to, that, rece to receiving that letter, uh, I have transmitted it to the Environmental Protection Agency, which I can assure you is thinking intensely about um, about the issues that were raised. All right, let's just step back now and, and, and look at a at a broader perspective. Uh, you're seeing now agencies more and more going into these emergency rulemaking uh, procedures, where the rules take effect immediately and then and, and end up being in effect permanently. Do you think we've maybe broadened the definition of what an emergency is beyond what? the average American uh, citizen would think is an emergency? You are taking me back to my days as an administrative law teacher. The, uh, the Administrative Procedure Act allows agencies to dispense with notice and comment rulemaking when it is unnecessary, impracticable, or contrary to the public interest. That is the statutory term. Uh, sometimes that is referred in shorthand as an emergency exception, which I think is a useful way of reminding everyone, maybe particularly agencies, that the ordinary course is to go through notice and comment. Uh, what I believe and what OIRA is firmly committed to and what the President, more importantly, has directed us as of January 18th to be firmly committed to is a 60-day notice and comment period 
unless there is some very unusual circumstance. And can you talk a little bit about uh, sue and settle, where agencies are basically forced to uh, implement rules as a result of a lawsuit uh, from an activist group and basically sidestepping the normal procedure that way as well? Well, I think there are a couple of different situations that that rubric might capture. Uh, let's, call, let's describe the optimistic one first. Uh, the optimistic one is where the plaintiff, it could be a, a company that wants to avoid a burden, it could be an environmental group that wants to, uh, uh, to clean the air or the water, uh, has a really good argument on the merits, let's suppose. And then the agency decides we are going to lose. Why don't we enter into a settlement agreement, which will give us, in some cases, more flexibility and room to maneuver than could happen if the case went to trial? So that, that is completely legitimate. All I would say as OIRA administrator for that one is that, that it should be clear that the public comment process and the legal requirements of the statute and the requirements of the executive order, including careful cost-benefit analysis, cho choice of least burdensome alternative, et cetera, to the extent permitted by law, all the, have their appropriate play. I, uh, I, would love, I would love to sit down with you over coffee and have about 30 minutes <laughs> to discuss that and the separation of powers right. issues associated with it on a, on a former right. lawyer to law right. professor right. Uh, level. But I have only got about uh, 30 seconds mm -hmm. left, so I want to just pose uh, one more uh, thought for uh, your consumption as well as those that are uh, watching. Historically, we have had scientists that are running these government agencies and in leadership posts. And I think now more than ever we are seeing uh, political appointees and very often political appointees from activist organizations that are taking over leadership roles in executive uh, uh, branch regulatory agencies. Do you see that uh, uh, as a trend and or as a problem? It is a great question, and I, I don't have enough kind of data about what the trends have been. Uh, what what it would, I would say is very clear after my two and a half years at, at this office is that scientific issues are often fundamental to regulatory decisions, and, they, and I agree with you, the scientific decisions have to be made by scientists, not by, uh, by people who are political. Uh, thank you very much. I see I am out of time. That is a rare sight you have. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I guess I will recognize myself for five minutes, and if no one else returns, you are done. <laughs> I bet you somebody else will show up, though. It just always happens. It is a busy day, and I appreciate your understanding of people going in and out. I am going to just do some follow-up here. Uh, in the case of the GYPSA, situation, one in which it wasn't $100 million, now it is $100 million, perhaps multi-billion. Uh, in addition to, obviously, this economic review, would you commit to, uh, to ensuring that there is a public comment period opened, as there would have been had we realized that it was at least 10 times $100 million initially? Uh, uh, because the Secretary of Agriculture has the statutory lead. Uh, what you mean is you have already been told no, so no, the answer is no? Definitely, definitely not. So I, I would not say uh, no to that, because I, I, the general proposition, not only do I agree with, I think it is fundamentally important that, the, in, in general, the cost-benefit analysis has to be exposed to the public so that you can figure out whether the assessment might have something wrong in it. Right. Don't make me buy something when I find out the price afterwards. Exactly. Exactly. So what, what I will commit to is engaging with the USDA on exactly that issue. I appreciate that, and I realize under the law that is the most we could ask for. Uh, would you do agree to do essentially the same thing in the case of CAFE, where we have sort of got the cart before the horse and uh, a additional comment and, and, and process could be helpful. There is no question that before that rule is finalized, there needs to be a public comment process, not only on the ultimate numbers, but on every ingredient of the numbers, as is standard. Okay. And as you might have heard, I know you heard earlier with Dr. Graham, you know, concerns about the benefit analysis, particularly the weighting of uh, electric cars as though they commit, you know, if you, if you say there is no pollution when there is pollution, you are obviously distorting the cost-benefit uh, consideration. So hopefully that would be something you would commit to do. 
Would you say, from, from your position, that executive orders, per se, fall very far short of legislative action? Uh, in general, legislative action uh, has um, uh, more longevity than executive orders. That I would say. Well, you know, the reason I ask you, and this was Mr. Gowdy doesn't do traps, I enjoy doing this one, is my staff gave me this question because in 2002, in the Law Review uh, article you co-authored, co uh, it states that executive orders are not per se, semicolon, they are not sufficient for real change. Uh, that was a position that I think was, was accurate, that executive orders exist in the vacuum of something defined and that something defined and put into statute in one procedure or another, rulemaking in some cases and clearly legislation being the, normally the first, is the only thing that has longevity. Wouldn't you agree? Well, in general, it it's turned out that the Reagan executive order from the early 80s, and I happened to be at the Justice Department at the time, so uh, in, in the Reagan administration, that the basic framework has lasted for decades. And, and my hope is and my belief is that this is now regulatory review in one or another form is a permanent part of the, uh, the, our regulatory structure. But, but regulatory uh, laws like a declaration of war, are, are there until they are repealed. Executive orders, for example, the executive order that everyone said year after year was great, which is we won't assassinate a foreign head of state, it was only good until the first time a secret executive order said go get them. So the executive order actually meant nothing, nothing at all year after year after year. I am a little concerned that if we don't come to that agreement, that an executive order is appropriate in order to guide the executive branch in the absence of guidance, which is appropriate, but that ultimately if that guidance is intended to be acted on permanently, it should be codified in law uh, as a regular matter of course. Well, and I will take, for example, the Mineral Management Service created by executive order under President uh, Reagan. I think it is Reagan. Uh, dysfunctional, hopeless organization, reviewed and always uh, having problems. And part of the problem was that it really hadn't, it was put together from, a, from a conceptually and then never really dealt with uh, after that. And of course, President Obama made it very clear in, in the reorganization that that needed to be done now. I hear you. And the, the uh, kind of uh, uh, statutory requirements that overlap with the executive order, including the Paperwork Reduction Act, the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, and the Regulatory Flexibility Act, those are all statutory, and we are strongly supportive of them. Okay. Well, I am going to take a break on the first round and go to the gentleman from Maryland for a second round first. Go ahead, Mr. This is only going to take a second. You know, I um, now, one of the things that I am concerned about is how President Obama is portrayed. And, you know, I just listened to you um, talk about this whole look back process. I hear my Republican colleagues beat up on President Obama. And it gets a little bit emotional for me, to be frank with you. Because here is a president that is probably doing more than just about any other president in looking back. Am I right? Did Bush do this? Did President Bush do this? Uh, no one has done it in this system. Not, I mean, like this. Right. Agreed. And so, you know, um, I think the president, in fairness to him, heard our colleagues and tried to create a balanced approach to trying to do this. And, and, and the reason why I bring this up is based upon the answers to the questions that you just gave to the chairman. He asked you about this rule. You said, okay, we're looking back. You talk about the screening problem. We're doing that. You, we, you, I mean, and, and that is the balanced approach that makes sense. As a matter of fact, I think if it were done that way, there's not a person on this committee that would, I, I don't think, that would disagree with that, with the understanding that there are some things that became, become outdated, and you explained it quite well, why it is, how you are able to find uh, those kinds of rules that are outdated, 
that there are problems with and that we need to get rid of. All of us want to create jobs. God knows. I have got in my district probably a 35 percent African American male unemployment rate, black. I want to create jobs. I also want them to be in safe jobs. Now, going back to the, the GYPSA rule, the, the letter that was admitted in the record a little bit earlier um, has a piece in here which I found very interesting. And I know the young lady who testified on this talked about there were a lot of organizations that did not, uh, you know, that, that were not related to uh, this whole agricultural situation. But the, but the 15 to sign this, well, maybe about 14 to sign this letter, the Campaign for Contract Agriculture Reform, Center for Rural Affairs, Dakota Resource Council. Anyway, I go on and on. All of them are agriculture related, the, the 14 to sign this letter. But one of the things, the one that was admitted into the record, um, the question is, they have got a paragraph here that says, and this is why this is so interesting, this is, pri this is part of the letter. Prior to the proposed rule, USDA held numerous meetings with all parties with an interest in the proposed rule. After issuing the pro proposed rule, USDA took a step of extending the comment period 120 days, an extraordinary period time for regulatory comment period. The comment period on the proposed rule closed on November 22, 2011. Over 60,000 comments were submitted on the proposed rule, including numerous detailed comments addressing the potential economic benefits and costs of the proposed rule. US, uh, USDA also responded to the requests of livestock, poultry packers, processors to assign the USDA chief economist to oversee preparation of a comprehensive economic analysis of the GYPSA final rule. To date, USDA has taken almost 10 months in its review of the public comments. The regulatory process of the GS GYPSA proposed rule has been lengthy, thorough, open, and even-handed. And even with all of that, and I am not knocking you for doing it, I am glad you are doing a look back, because I want it to be fair, even with all of that. You are still saying, we will take a look at it. And I think, and I am just going on the record to say that, you know, I think we ought to be fair to, this, to President Obama. At least he is trying to look back at something. I mean, this has already gone through a process. The other problem that I see, and you kind of, you, you, somebody talked about it a little bit earlier, and it kind of comes up in this. You know, the, the rulemaking can take so long. And going back to what the Chairman was saying, and I thought he made a very good point, is that, Sometimes by the rule time the rule comes up, it's outdated, and it doesn't make any sense anymore. So you know, I mean, I just ask you a comment. I only got eleven seconds, ten seconds. So would you comment on that? Well, there, and I'm not uh, knocking uh, the chairman or anyone. I yeah. just want a fair process. Yeah, there are a lot of important points there. So uh, it is true that sometimes the process of issuing rules is slower than it ought to be, including deregulatory rules. There is no question about that. And many people applauded our rule that uh, eliminated milk producers from the oil spill rule and thought, what took you so long? So com completely agree with that. So it would be good to think of ways to, to streamline not only rules, but processing, processes for issuing rules when there is a good reason to think that the rules uh, would do some good. And if, if we can work together on that, um, it would fit very well with our look back process, but also where there is uh, an urgent public safety or health need, that would, would also be a good, a good thing. We got a rule out that is presenting, I think, 79,000 illnesses from salmonella and eggs. It also exempts, by the way, small farmers who aren't the source of the problem. So it is protective of small business as well as the American public. Many people thought that that rule which has benefits well in excess of costs uh, took too long to get out. The protection was uh, slower than it ought to have been. Thank you. I will now recognize myself. Uh, we have spent a lot of time on GYPSA. Fortunately, you came very prepared, so that is helpful. Uh, I am sure you are familiar that uh, in the 2008 Farm Bill, uh, we, uh, in the discussion draft, now this, remember, not to be partisan, but to be descriptive, Republican President, but a Democratic House and Senate. The language included in the discussion draft at the Senate Committee markup of the Farm Bill 
included the provision that would have allowed for what the rule is being proposed to do, which is not requiring a plaintiff in order to have a lawsuit. So considered by the Democratic Senate at the time, rejected, law happens without it. On what basis, fundamental basis, does the branch of execution get to do something that was rejected by or reasonably believed to be rejected by the body that created the law? Well, it would be hard to identify such a basis unless it is the case that the statutory text um, uh, authorized the Secretary of Agriculture to do this. And so uh, I, the earlier question suggested that this goes beyond congressional intent. If so, that is a very serious problem. If there is a delegation of authority to the Secretary to resolve this question, that would be the only possible answer. Well, and let us go through something, because this is a unique opportunity, or not unique, because you have been very generous to come here and come here again now, but we, we, and we will ask you back again. But, but because of the regulatory process and because, quite frankly, C-SPAN and other groups sort of help us get out some constitutional questions, the Founding Fathers did not have regulatory language in the Constitution. They did not envision the executive branch passing laws. This is something that was created afterwards. And it didn't set limits. So let's, let's go through a process. In order to make a law currently, the House and the Senate have to pass bills that are identical through an initial process or through conference. They then have to send it to a president and have it either signed or, if vetoed, they must override it with two-thirds of both houses. That is the law. Once a law is in place, if the executive branch, and correct me if I am wrong at any point, the executive branch chooses to, quite frankly, extract out of pure air or thin cloth some ability to add another law, regulations are laws, rules are laws. The only way that that can be stopped is either through a very unusual court challenge, which is rare because they defer to us to fix it, or a two-thirds majority of the House and the Senate telling the President he's wrong, effectively. We can do it through an ordinary majority, but then he can veto it. So isn't that the current status of the balance between a rule chosen by the President or even an executive order is that he can do anything he wants to do, he being the executive branch, that the Congress doesn't have a two-third majority to stop. Isn't that part of the balance that currently exists? I, I hope that that is more pessimistic than re reality. And, and by the way, I wasn't saying this happens regularly or that there isn't consultation, but ultimately, isn't that one of the realities is mm -hmm. that the check and balance of we can have oversight, but to actually say we don't approve of your rule, we have to get majorities in the House and the Senate in order to do it, and, even, and on top of that, in a timely fashion, or we have to pass a new law, start to finish, and strike it down. I, I, I just add two points. One is that if a, if a rule is um, uh, proposed by an executive agency, uh, the general counsel's office at the department, call it the Department of Transportation, which has a superb general counsel, is carefully has a superb cabinet officer too. Yes, it does. Absolutely, is, is uh, very much engaged on the question whether the the rule conforms to congressional instructions. And so the first line of defense is the lawyers at the general counsel's office. If that is. Uh, uh, but, but they are executive branch employees. Yes, though it happens time and again, I can say this from experience, that the general counsel's office or subsequent people engaged in the legal issue will say that is not what Congress meant, that is uh, not okay. consistent with Well, well let us go through the process. Congress recently acted, we, and, and we have acted previously, to set CAFE standards. We have, in fact, been the creators and the setter of CAFE standards delegated to NHTSA. How do we get these CAFE standards this time? Didn't we get them around congress clear congressional intent, and isn't that part of why it is so controversial? Well, if uh, you could imagine NHTSA doing some things that would be in plain violation of the uh, underlying statute, and that would come out, the inconsistency with the underlying statute. Well, but, but understand, the President said he did this without Congress. So, you know, it is very clear that the President did it without Congress. He did it without the process that has existed in the past. Where, in, to your knowledge, 
was there an intent of Congress to have the executive branch uh, from time to time raise those standards on their own? Okay. It, it, th that would be the, the fuel economy statute, which, as, as you said, that delegates authority to the Department of Transportation. So that, it was without Congress in one respect. That is, the Congress didn't particularly select levels or mechanisms, but it was pursuant to a delegation of authority to the agency, which is a constrained delegation. And in fact, NHTSA has run into legal challenges for, not in this administration, but in prior administrations, for not acting consistently with the, uh, the, the legal constraints, or at least so it was challenged. So, so what's clear is that there couldn't be the creation of a CAFE standard, you know, just out of thin air. Well, yes, but and I'm, my time has expired, so let me do this. I'm going to yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania and ask him if he'd yield me back time. I will do that, sir. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, quickly, under the ESA, or ESA Act, conveniently similar to my name, we, we prohibited EPA from doing this and yet they have done it. So we can have a lot of argument, the courts may ultimately have arguments, but isn't it clear that the President's administration made a decision to do this, and they made a decision to do it without precedent, specifically based on actions that were created by Congress? And I know you are not a constitutional, you are a very good scholar, you are not a constitutional scholar per se, but isn't this Once upon a time. <laughs> well, but isn't this becoming a constitutional question? And, and isn't that one of those in which the American people have to ask, do they trust this administration, the next administration? You didn't trust the last administration in some of your, your writings. Uh, and shouldn't we ultimately seize back a great deal of this through some process that says, go ahead and make your rules, but ultimately you have to get Congress's buy-in in real time? Well, what I would say is that there are a couple of things that are uh, built into our system that are responsive to your question. The first is one of the President's core constitutional responsibilities is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So adherence to the law is at the heart of the executive power under Article II. It is also the case that uh, Congress has uh, mechanisms which have been used to express its uh, You mean the exactly one time where ever it was shut down a rule? Well, I didn't just mean the Congressional Review Act. I also meant uh, offering input and criticism uh, of the direction in which any executive branch is going. And we have seen a couple of examples in the last uh, hours. And I can't emphasize strongly enough that if there is a rule that is under review at our office or that the Department of Transportation, let us say, is devising that seems to those who are responsible for the legislation to be inconsistent with it, uh, that voice matters greatly to well, the Let me ask you one last question, and I appreciate the continued indulgence of the gentleman. If we were to pass a law today that said the President must, on a quarterly basis, bring us his package of regulations for a package vote up or down, essentially give us the right to vote as a package, and if we didn't like it, we would vote the package down if it was sufficient. Wouldn't that make those regulations truly bought in by the American people, and wouldn't it make it inherently harder to pass a regulation? And by the way, the same would be true of rolling back legislation. The, the gentleman very rightfully so said, concern about regulations going away. But isn't that the best way to have the confidence of the American people, potentially, rather than the arguments that have gone on here today? I, I don't know what would be the best way to have the confidence of the American people. I do but know. Let's switch it to it. Wouldn't we pass less regs if, if, in fact, the President had to come to Congress with his package of regs to get codification, rather than uh, passing them, as, if you will, sua sponte. There would be fewer regs and fewer deregs, and whether that diminution in number would pass the cost-benefit test, that is the question. And it is a good one. I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, Professor, again, thanks for your indulgence. Uh, I know this can't be easy. Going back to this cafe, because I think it is important for the American people to understand. And my concern with all this is it doesn't matter what President's watch it happens on. Uh, whoever it is that is sitting in the chair gets, either gets the praise or the blame. So it really is it's truly a bipartisan criticism. Uh, with CAFE, though, and what has always bothered me, we are able, as a government, to eliminate consumer choice 
by coming up with these standards? It, it, if you could just help me on that, and I, and I think I have a better understanding right now after the, the Chairman's last line of questioning, but it is it's disturbing to me because we really are eliminating, we are picking and choosing what people are allowed to drive and not drive or purchase and not purchase. The market really determines that. And I would say that as far as gas mileage is concerned, when the price of gasoline goes up, people go to smaller cars. It doesn't really have anything to do with CAFE. So if, if you could. Okay. There, the, the, the recent announcement by the President is um, the initiation of a process that will involve engagement with a number of the issues that have been raised today including public notice and comment on issues, including consumer choice issues. Uh, what I would emphasize with respect to CAFE standards is that there has been kind of bipartisan enthusiasm for assessment of costs and benefits, and at least the CAFE standards that have been issued in this administration have had benefits very far in excess of costs, really extraordinarily far in, in excess of costs, and have also uh, allowed a very great room for consumer choice. So it would be one thing to say, you know, every car has to get 50 miles per gallon. It would be another thing to say that there is a fleet-wide average of X, and the, the number of cars that are on the road can span an extraordinarily wide range. And consistent with the executive order, which values flexibility and freedom of choice, I am with you that uh, any cafe structure uh, should have a, a wide range of options rather than be draconian. It, so, so one question, which really isn't for the OIRA administrator to answer, it's for uh, the people who are authorized by Article I of the Constitution, you all, to answer. The question is whether the, uh, the economic, uh, energy security, and environmental benefits of a CAFE standard uh, justify such restrictions as there are on the market. And there was a report, I believe, in the early 2000s uh, from the National Academy of Sciences, a very detailed report by uh, a wide range of respected people, which ultimately concluded was supportive of Congress's judgment, which is in favor of CAFE standards. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, and again, I, I do want to thank you for coming up. It, I, I'm sure it's never pleasant to testify before a congressional committee. Um, according to a recent Wall Street Journal article, the Obama administration considered but ultimately rejected a partial moratorium on uh, new regulations. Is that correct? Well, the Wall Street Journal, I believe, said that. That is correct. Uh, were you? <laughs> well, well, did they? Are you aware of? Well, they, there was a. Were well, you involved in any discussions what, about that? What, what I am aware of is that in any domain that bears on economic policy, uh, a wide range of questions uh, uh, come up, and any administration that is uh, determined to help uh, make things better, as ours is, uh, would consider. Uh, every question that a reasonable person might ask, and it is true that a number of people on the outside have raised that question. So, uh, I mean, I guess, and I, and I don't mean to try to pin you down. I mean, are you aware of any of the issues that were considered uh, in in not implementing that moratorium? Okay, I, I can tell you a bit about why uh, a moratorium is not uh, is not is not coming. If that would be helpful. Uh, one problem, which is sharp, closely related to the previous chairman's, your immediate predecessor in that chair, is the executive has to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. A moratorium would violate the requirement that the laws be faithfully executed. So it would have to be a highly qualified moratorium. Second, a moratorium would sweep up deregulatory measures, which we are uh, pretty enthusiastic about expediting because they are uh, regulatory actions. And third, and this is an important point, a moratorium would uh, not be um, uh, a scalpel or a machete. It would be more like a nuclear bomb in the sense that it would prevent regulations that, let us say, cost very little and have very significant economic or public health benefits. So a moratorium would have the disadvantage of defying what every president since President Reagan has endorsed, which is cost-benefit analysis. Now, we were talking a partial moratorium, and it seems this administration has not been, uh, has not stopped itself from picking and choosing which laws it 
chooses to affect. I mean, we have seen the administration publicly uh, say they are not going to enforce the Defense of Marriage Act, for, for example. So it is something they could do if they chose to do. Well, what I would say is, in, in the regulatory oper apparatus, to say we won't um, issue rules that Congress has required us to issue, that would violate the Take Care Clause. Uh, you know, I am not going to advocate uh, either side on that. I just wanted to follow up on that article. Um, in his opening statement, I don't believe you were here, but the opening statement for the uh, first panel, Chairman Micah of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee held up a chart with the amount and level of government regulations uh, associated with uh, building a highway. His number says it takes about six years to uh, build a highway, uh, basically saying shovel ready basically does not exist in the amount of time. You know, I question how uh, some of these regulatory agencies sleep at night knowing as they delay these people are not going back to work and, uh, and, and not on a job. Uh, do you have any solutions for this that we could, anything that, I, I realize you are working on it from your end, do you have some things we could do on our end? We are costing ourselves money tripling the price of highway projects and delaying getting people back to work. Um, I agree completely that there is a problem with um, permitting requirements that at least in some important cases are uh, having unfortunate delaying effects on desirable projects. I agree completely with that. If we have rules coming forward that uh, add to that problem, uh, they will have close scrutiny. Uh, what I would suggest, just as in this case a, a consumer rather than uh, uh, a, a, an important actor, that uh, engagement with the Jobs Council, the President's Jobs Council here would be very helpful. They are uh, uh, centrally concerned about this topic. Uh, Jeff Zients, who is the Deputy Director at OMB, is centrally concerned with this problem. And uh, it would be very good in this current economic situation as an opportunity uh, to improve the permitting process. And as a Texan, Texas kind of prides itself on being a business friendly, as little regulation as possible state. And one of the ways we were able to maintain that is all uh, executive agencies in Texas face a sunset process and have to come back before the legislature to. Uh, justify their existence. Do you see a benefit in uh, adopting something like that on a Federal level? It, it, it may be too um, rigid, but I will tell you what I do see a benefit in that is closely analogous, uh, is to take our look-back process not as a one-shot endeavor, but as a, uh, a, a, a location for the creation of teams and institutions that are constantly, and not just because a President says so in a prominent document, but are constantly looking at rules to see if they should be eliminated. And if you look at the, the plans, and we could certainly use your, your help on this, they say that there are, this, is, this is a continuing endeavor. If members of the public see rules, including permitting related rules that are causing harm or rules that are not consistent with how technologies now operate or rules that were not a good idea at the beginning but were not gotten rid of because the agency issued the rule and then declared victory and went on, there are teams now at the departments that are, uh, are, are available to try to get that fixed. It isn't quite a sunset provision, but it could serve many of the same functions. Thank you very much. And let me just ask you one more question, if you will indulge me. Um, I get the sense that in, in some areas of the government, there is a let's look for a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. It may be that there are people in jobs that say, I need to make my job relevant or some sort of mindset where let's do something where there isn't a problem. I mean, it is outside the probably, it, it's probably too small potatoes to be on your plate. We have an example in the district I represent in South Texas where uh, the you know, National Park Service wants to lower the speed limit on the Padre Island National Seashore from 25 to 15 miles an hour to protect the endangered Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, when there has never been one incident on the Padre Island National Seashore of a turtle being hit uh, by a car. Do you have any thoughts on things we could do to maybe just change the mindset of if it to 
let's justify my job, let's have more regulations, let's make it harder to, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality? In, in the rulemaking area, we are, um, are very conscious of the need, as the President said the other night, uh, to show that the rule is required. And what served, um, I think, both Republican and Democratic administrations in good stead in this domain, it is just a small part of, of the whole government, of course, is to require right off the bat a description of the market failure or other problem that justifies regulation. If you can't get over that threshold by saying there is a market failure or other prob problem, then you probably should devote yourself to some other uh, uh, issue. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come and uh, testify before this committee. I look forward to uh, seeing you again, uh, and I, I would like to commend you on the job you are doing. Uh, it is it, a big one. And uh, again, thank you very much for testifying. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, we are done. <laughs>